asking. So sure. please uh, keep your camera unless you have a technical problem. Thank you very much. This meeting is being recorded. Okay, Fred, I think I think we can get started now. Very good. Good morning, good day, good evening, good afternoon to all of you, and welcome to the 19th annual Global Forum on Competition from OECD. I'm very happy to know that a lot of uh, uh, good friends have joined us and also some uh, newcomers. Um, and uh, I just want to start by saying that we have a very ambitious program uh, for this uh, four days forum. Uh, we will talk about important enforcement issues uh, which have been chosen in uh, cooperation between both the OECD members and the non-OECD members who participate in this forum. Uh, we will talk on abuse of dominance uh, in digital markets, the use of economic analysis in merger control, the
the role of market investigations in emerging competition issues. But today we're going to start by asking ourselves some fundamental questions about how relevant are our competition policy and competition law enforcement tools, how well prepared we are to meet the numerous new technological and public policy challenges uh, we are going to face in the next few years, and what adaptation, if any, do we need to implement? To opening this year's forum, I would like, it's a great pleasure to uh, give the floor to Secretary General Angel Guria. Mr. Secretary General, you have the floor. So, um, dear uh, Margaret uh, and uh, dear Frédéric, uh, Monsieur Chairman, um, Ambassadors, uh, colleagues, uh, dear friends, welcome to the 19th OECD Global Forum on Competition. I'm pleased to see that the Global Competition Policy Committee uh, community remains closely connected despite these difficult times. That uh, I always say that it's uh, like a group therapy. Um, and uh, I have to say it's probably now more necessary than ever. Um, we're facing a, a historic challenge. Uh, the social and economic impacts of the pandemic have been staggering. You know, more than one and a half million lives have been lost. Um, the global economy will contract this year by uh, about 4.2%. That's the whole of the global, you know, the totality of the economy of the world. And even if we project a rebound in global GDP by around 4.2% in 2021, we still expect it to be about 6 trillion lower by the end of 2022 than what we were projecting before the uh, COVID. So big damage, big numbers. Many governments have taken decisive action to cushion the effects of the crisis. And uh, this has included grants, loans, guarantees, uh, 5, 10, 15, 20, 25% of GDP in many other countries. You know, this is a very, very large numbers um, in support of workers, firms, of health. Now, such measures have been necessary to ensure the survival of the firms and the livelihoods of people. They must be managed carefully, however, to ensure that the market competition is not distorted. Indeed, our analysis shows that market dynamism has suffered. In some OECD countries, New business creation has declined and has declined by as much as 20% relative to last year. While at the same time, fewer companies have exited the market. So the, the churn is slowing down. Competition policy has a paramount role to play in the recovery to keep markets open to entry to advocate against government support measures that hinder economic adjustments by keeping low productivity, what we call the zombie firms in the market. Uh, as we discuss ways to reset, to, to strengthen competition policy, we should always remember that it is an Credible force for good in our, econ in our economies and in, in our societies. Competition drives productivity growth. It drives innovation. Ultimately, uh, economic growth. Weak competition results in higher prices, which lowers the purchasing power of families, especially of the families with a lower income. It also worsens inequalities. 
lack of competition generates economic rents for the few, while curtailing opportunities for the many. Now, there may be disagreements in this room about how much change is needed, but we're all committed to the promotion of competitive markets. And we need to remain open-minded on how to best deliver on this essential objective. We must focus on tackling important challenges to competition. Over the past year, we have witnessed large, very important companies at the center of a widening range of investigations focusing on anti-competitive conduct in multiple jurisdictions. Oh. Policies that favor certain firms over others that undermine the level playing field will be counterproductive at best and harmful at worst. Now, amid widespread increases in concentration and in markups in OECD economies, markups are a very clear sign of concentration and lack of competition. The ability to include competition in industrial policies is paramount. Calls are growing for competition authorities to incorporate other dimensions into their work. Inequality, sustainability, the welfare of workers. Now, the pandemic has exposed the urgency of these challenges. And there's also a need to consider the changes that are needed to, to strengthen competition enforcement in digital markets. The pandemic has accelerated the digital transformation. What would have taken a few years has taken a few weeks, a few months. So these changes are as vital as ever and could include increasing digital expertise within the competition authorities. We need the experts that are promoting competition the competition authorities themselves to have uh, expertise in order to better control, to better regulate, to consider the optimal burden of proof in digital cases, to strengthen merger control, uh, to address the so-called killer acquisitions and killer means basically that they kill competition. And last but not least, competition authorities must consider new tools. For example, market investigations. These new tools will help address competition problems in markets outside the context of more traditional enforcement proceedings. So, um, dear chair, uh, dear friends and colleagues, the task ahead for competition authorities is a significant one. You have such an important role to play in the design of the economic recovery to ensure that markets remain open, but that they remain competitive. Oh, the Global Forum on Competition remains an opportunity for, again, as I said, uh, not only group therapy, but also exchange. What works? What is more difficult these days? What is faster? Now, the consultations among competition authorities led by your distinguished chair 
uh, are always crucial in these meetings. Now, normally we meet with the, in the flesh, we meet personally, uh, but I would like to encourage you to not be discouraged by circumstances and to continue to um, think boldly about the challenges we face. More than ever, competition policy is a vital part of the path forward, of the path to promote a sustainable, resilient, and inclusive economic recovery. I thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Secretary General, for those uh, kind, word, uh, kind words for the competition community. Um, you mentioned not only the importance of uh, competition in general, but also in particular, the importance of competition authorities being up to speed to face the digital age. And I must say that both in this forum, as I mentioned earlier, where we're going to look at issues of abuse of dominance in the digital sector, but also in the competition committee, which just took place uh, last week, where we looked at competition among ecosystems. We are very much focused on trying to ensure that competition authorities are, uh, have the best possible tools and the best possible reflection to uh, meet this particular challenge. As you've mentioned, uh, implicitly, the theme that, that we have chosen for uh, this first day is does competition policy and competition enforcement need a reset? Uh, and these quite broad themes that you have outlined captures both the mood of many within the uh, community, the competition policy community, but also beyond the competition policy community. Uh, as you very uh, rightly pointed out, the COVID crisis has intensified some of the questions which were already on the table, uh, were already discussed in the uh, competition community. For example, you mentioned the increase in uh, concentration and uh, margins, and there were questions in the literature and also in public discussions about whether or not competition had been effective enough um, and whether this increase in constant oppression did not in fact reveal a weakness of enforcement of, of competition policy. Um, there were questions about the relationship between industrial policy and competition policy. Everybody remembers the Alstom Siemens uh, uh, merger case and the fact that ideas about uh, the fact that maybe uh, industrial policy was something that was needed as a complement, maybe sometimes as a substitute of competition policy, uh, were um, talked about. Well, now we have on top of this the idea about the relocation of uh, uh, the value chain uh, at the regional level or at the national level. We have the issues, of course, of the massive reallocation of resources which are required both in the, for the digital transition, but also uh, for sustainability. Um, so those questions of industrial policy uh, and competition policy have been become even more important after the COVID crisis. The pressure to include public policy goals uh, as sustainability and equality you have mentioned. Um, the question of how we can have a fair competition at the international level given the fact that the trade negotiations have led to opening up international markets to firms that belong to very different economic systems. And some of those systems are systems where, as you mentioned, state-owned enterprises or state-supported firms compete with firms from other economies which are not state-supported, do not have access to the same facilities. And there is a big question there of what is the meaning of this international competition? Can we make it more fair? Can we level the playing field? And of course, last but not least, there is the need to adapt to uh, the digital uh, economy. And there, there are questions of resources, of course, for competition authorities, but there are also substantive questions. Do we have the adequate tools uh, to, in fact, face some of the 
new forms of competition that take place in the digital world. Uh, now, all those questions we're going to uh, examine uh, today, uh, they are uh, very broad questions. And I must say that in a sense, this is the not the beginning, but it's only one of those discussions of, on, on those issues, because some of those issues, uh, such as the economic recovery, digital market, and sustainability, will also be uh, looked at in the open day, uh, the competition open day that will take place uh, at the OECD on the 24th of February. And I encourage all the participants to uh, also participate in this event. Now, I'm very pleased at this point to introduce our keynote speaker, um, Executive Vice President of the European Commission for a Europe fit for the digital age and European Commissioner for competition, uh, Mrs. Vestager. This will be, I'm pleased to note, her third uh, appearance at the, global, the OECD Global Forum. She was previously with us in 2016 and 2018 and I must say, uh, both personally and on behalf of all of us, that we greatly appreciate uh, the fidelity with which she has been willing to come and participate and, uh, uh, and talk to us um, over the years. Um, I believe that this year it is particularly important to listen to what uh, uh, Vice President Vestager has to say, because the European Commission has taken uh, recent initiatives, which are of great relevance to the uh, themes which I uh, mentioned. For example, uh, the commission has been actively considering the need for adjustment to competition enforcement tools in the wake of digitalization. And it has appointed an expert panel on this topic, which delivered its final report last year and with a wide ranging set of recommendations. The European Commission has also been considering the issue of foreign subsidies uh, and the extent to which they can distort markets within the EU. Uh, and uh, earlier, it has adopted a white paper, uh, which has uh, three, uh, which deals with three uh, sub-issues, the need for a general supervisory instrument to address the distortive effect of uh, foreign subsidies, along with potential remedies, including redress payment, Second, the need for a review of foreign subsidies that may enable the acquisition of EU companies with distortive effects. And third, the need to identify whether foreign subsidies may grant an unfair advantage in EU public procurement procedures. So, so clearly this issue of uh, how to try to manage uh, to better, to increase the level playing field or to make it more level at the international level has been a, an important consideration for EU competition uh, policy. Third, the commission has developed a proposal for a new competition tool to address structural issues that cannot be tackled through existence dominance uh, uh, provisions in competition law. Um, while this tool has been discussed in the context of digitalization, it is likely to apply to all markets and may bear some similarities to the market investigation tool, which is already in place in some other jurisdictions. And finally, I would mention the fact that the commission has been reflecting on whether competition enforcement can be supportive of environmental, environmental sustainability objectives and whether this will require new measures. And this has been an issue, particularly in the context of the recovery of the COVID crisis, where we know a lot of state aid has been granted. And the question is, uh, among others, the question of whether one can use the conditionalities of this state aid uh, to uh, pursue some of those uh, environmental sustainability objectives. So Mrs. Vestager has a significant experience in thinking about the topics of our discussion today. She has kindly agreed to stay after her speech for a few minutes to take your questions. So please use the uh, question and answer or the chat. James, which one is it? The chat or? It's the question and answer. The question and answer function uh, on Zoom to send your question to the secretary. We will have only a few minutes for this discussion. Madam Executive Vice President, it's a pleasure to have you again. And I turn the floor over to you. 
Well, thank you very much, uh, both for this uh, very elaborate uh, welcome uh, on the things that we work with, uh, but also for inviting me back. Uh, it is indeed an honor. Uh, it would have been uh, better to be with you in Paris for the sparkle of the, of the Eiffel Tower and, uh, and the decorations of the big windows uh, and all of that that comes with uh, being together in person and discussing the things, because I think there is a lot to discuss. Uh, this time of year is a good time to, to look back on, on what we have achieved, uh, what we are still in the process of doing, what uh, challenges uh, we have ahead of us. So I, I think this is, this is very important. And it may be that we cannot be in Paris, but the most important thing is still here. Uh, and that is our willingness to work together uh, to share experiences, to find new ways of, uh, of doing things, and, and to try to see things from, from different perspectives, uh, because the markets are not the same. Uh, even though we are a global community of competition law enforcers, we still have different tasks to do. Uh, we have different uh, challenges uh, on a daily basis. Uh, looking back at, at this year, um, even if there's not much doubt, well, uh, we have been through very, very important uh, changes. Uh, in the last 12 months, uh, the coronavirus have taken well over 1 million lives. Uh, livelihoods have been destroyed. Uh, people have lost their jobs. It has plunged our economies into the deepest recession uh, in at least a century. It has also, I think, shown us at our best how selfless uh, work has been done by so many key workers uh, who have not had the choice uh, to telework, but who had to be there uh, in the hospitals, uh, in the supermarkets, uh, taking uh, all the trash away. People who have taken the risk uh, to be there to enable the rest of us uh, actually to, to do a lot of things that we used to do, only in a very different way. Because um, even though no single uh, part of our life is unaffected, and that of course also goes for competition law enforcement, uh, I think we have been able to adapt uh, from the very early of spring to new ways of doing things, uh, to work uh, online, uh, accepting merger filing electronically uh, in place space of big boxes of, of documents piling up uh, outside of uh, at the door. Uh, also had to allowing businesses to pause uh, as much as we could uh, from providing us with information while companies adjusted uh, to the effects of the pandemic. And at the same time, to prepare ourselves to deal very quickly with this enormous amount of state aid cases uh, because of the obvious need uh, to help businesses to get government funds to the places where they were most needed in order to preserve uh, jobs and value and preserve uh, the effectiveness uh, of the single market. It turned out that the slowdown in, uh, in murders and, anti and antitrust work was only temporary. Uh, by the end of October, uh, we've had uh, nearly 300 uh, merger filings, uh, and the pandemic has not stopped us from dealing with also very tricky mergers. Uh, in July, uh, just to give you one example, uh, we approved uh, the merger between Alstom and Bombardier uh, after the two companies agreed uh, to sell off uh, parts of their business to keep uh, competition uh, working for things like signaling systems uh, and very high speed trains. Uh, we're also back in, in the usual rhythm when it comes to enforcing um, antitrust rules, uh, especially in some of today's most essential markets uh, like the pharmaceuticals, rail transport, digital services. Uh, in October, we accepted commitments from Broadcom. Uh, they make chips for modems and, uh, and TV set-top uh, boxes. Uh, Broadcom committed uh, to stop enforcing contractual clauses 
that tie customers uh, to exclusivity uh, deal. Um, we also set the statement of objection to check rail, uh, setting out our preliminary uh, view uh, that the company broke uh, antitrust rules by uh, charging prices below its cost and by doing that, uh, undermining uh, competition in the marketplace. Uh, and in November, we issued a statement of objection uh, to Amazon with our initial conclusions uh, that the company used confidential data uh, about the sellers that uses its marketplace uh, to compete unfairly against the same sellers. Um, we also find Cephalon and Teva for agreeing to delay the entry of the cheaper generic drug of, uh, of Teva so that Cephalon's drug uh, would not face competition for some years. So it has been a busy year. Um, and when we look ahead uh, to 21, there's reason to be, be hopeful that with the new vaccines now coming, we can gradually come back uh, to something that more simulates, in my opinion, real life. Uh, because I think you miss important things if you're only digital. Very difficult to, to negotiate on Zoom, very difficult to brainstorm on WebEx, very uh, different, difficult to be fun on Skype for that matter. So I really do hope that we can come back uh, to the real thing. Uh, that being said, no matter how we work, uh, we have challenges uh, to deal with. Uh, because there's a long way to go before our economies are back as to what they were uh, before the crisis. And at the same time, we don't really want it to be back. We want it to move forward because we have the twin transitions of green and digital uh, to deal with, and that will change our economies and some of the dynamics of our economies. Um, and with such fundamental changes uh, going around uh, in our world, uh, I think it's only uh, right to ask if competition policy needs to change. To ask, uh, as the title of this event puts it, if the time has come for a reset. But the answer to that question very much depends on what you mean by a reset. Uh, if we are asking if it's time to change the aims of competition law enforcement, well, then the answer has to be a no. Because far from being obsolete, the goals of competition policy, well, they are, they are as fresh, they are as essential as they have ever been. Uh, I don't need to tell any of you about the benefits of, of competition. Lower prices, wider choice uh, for consumers, or the benefits of businesses of all sizes uh, to succeed. None of these things are new, uh, but right now, in times of enormous change, it's even more important than ever. And also in terms of, of our wish and our promise to create inclusive societies, it is important that the individual, also in the role as a consumer, is the one being served by the marketplace. There is this, another tiny drop, another element of democracy, of an inclusive society in well-working markets where the choice of the consumer actually makes a difference. Also, competitive markets can support the green transition. Uh, it can drive companies to make better, more efficient use of resources, encouraging them to switch to a circular economy where the waste from one product becomes the raw material uh, for another uh, product. And competition means that business have no choice, again, but to respond to consumers' uh, demand uh, for greener products. Meanwhile, uh, competition helps to make sure that digital technology uh, works for people and not the other way around. It gives consumers the power to, to demand a better deal, also uh, from the very biggest of tech companies, lower prices, more choice, more privacy. Uh, and it helps to make sure the drive to uh, innovate stays strong uh, so that we can realize the full potential of what digitization uh, has to offer. And as our economies face the challenges of recovering from the pandemic, 
competition can help them grow. Uh, it can help us make the most of our ability to innovate, driving companies to invest in new ideas, give the best companies room to succeed uh, without being held back by entrenched uh, monopolies. And it can help our economies to respond to change and redirect energies uh, towards the ind industries uh, that are the industries for the future. So what we need today is not to reset the aims of competition policy, uh, quite the contrary. It's more important than ever that we take effective uh, action uh, to keep competition working the way it should. Uh, and that will be our watchword uh, for the weeks, uh, for the months, uh, for the years ahead. Uh, when it comes to, to mergers, uh, we have a collection of important cases um, underway, like Google's takeover of Fitbit, uh, the combination of Fiat Chrysler and Peugeot, uh, at the merger of two Canadian airlines, uh, Air Canada and Transat. Uh, at the same time, we're working to make sure that our merger control system works as efficiently as possible. Uh, earlier this year, uh, we identified some important changes uh, that we can make to help our merger procedures work even better. Uh, we'll work closely with Europe's national uh, competition authorities uh, to refer cases to us that could seriously affect competition, but where the turnover of the company would not meet our notification thresholds. Uh, and we'll look at how we can increase the number of cases that qualify for our simplified uh, procedure without uh, harming our ability to protect competition. At the same time, uh, we'll keep using our antitrust uh, powers to keep competition working well, uh, especially in, in crucial markets like digital services and pharmaceuticals. Uh, when it comes to medicines, uh, we've been investigating whether Aspen uh, Pharmacare has been charging unfairly high prices uh, for some essential cancer drugs. Uh, this summer, uh, Aspen uh, offered to answer our concerns by cutting the prices of those medicines uh, by an average more than 70%. Uh, and we're now looking at the input that we got from, uh, from the market whether uh, those commitments uh, will actually work. Uh, in digital markets, we've opened a series of investigations uh, this year. In June, we launched a pair uh, of investigations uh, into Apple. Uh, we are looking at whether it misuses its uh, app store by forcing app developers to use its in-app purchase uh, system uh, to sell content. Uh, and we're investigating whether it denies uh, consumers' choice uh, by reducing uh, the use or restricting even the use of the NFC uh, feature on its devices. That's this feature that allows you to pay uh, just by tapping your phone on a, on a terminal. Uh, so only its own Apple Pay uh, can use this facility. Uh, we're also investing how Google and Facebook uh, collects uh, data uh, and how they use uh, that data to make money for, for advertising. And last month, uh, we started investigating whether Amazon has given preferential treatment uh, to its own services or to whether those who, who uses uh, the Amazon services, when it selects the sellers, uh, that gets the most uh, prominent display uh, for a certain product. So, so the changes we are facing in the markets uh, of the future, uh, they certainly don't call for a new approach to the goals of competition policy. Uh, what we need is not so much of a reset, it's more than that. Uh, I think in Hollywood they call it a reboot. Uh, when they reboot uh, old movies and TV shows, they bring back the characters uh, that we know, um, but with uh, the details refreshed and updated to a new era. Uh, and that is pretty much what competition policy needs. Uh, not to change what policy our policy is about, uh, but to make sure that with the tools that we have uh, to, to achieve those goals, 
that these tools, they are up to date. Uh, for instance, we just finalized our uh, consultation on how competition uh, and green uh, uh, deal policies can work best uh, together. Uh, we've had almost 200 replies uh, to that consultation, very valued uh, inputs, very detailed uh, ideas uh, as to how green and competition uh, can work together uh, in, in practice, in, in everyday life. And, uh, and we're looking forward to a very interesting discussion uh, on the 4th of February, when we are holding a conference uh, to bring together the different uh, perspective of these issues of how green and digital how do they work together? Uh, what should be their relationship? Uh, we're also developing new ways to deal with uh, big uh, digital platforms. Uh, obviously, uh, those platforms play a vital role uh, in helping computer, uh, consumers uh, find the things that they want uh, on the internet. Uh, they can though become uh, gatekeepers uh, with the ability to set the rules uh, that govern how companies connect to their customers. Uh, and of course, in that uh, connection also, uh, an ability to collect data uh, to an extent that is not open to anyone else. Uh, so we need two things. Uh, we need uh, regulation to set out the precise duties for these companies in advance. Uh, and we need competition law enforcement to deal with individual cases. Uh, and to make sure that we have the right powers uh, to make uh, com to keep more likely uh, competition working well in digital markets, uh, we'll soon propose a Digital Markets Act. Uh, the act will set, set out clear do's and don'ts uh, for the biggest uh, digital gatekeepers uh, on access to data, for instance, or certain types of uh, self-preferencing. So in the future, we will have regulation and competition law enforcement work hand in hand. Uh, we're also working on a new version of our market definition notice. Uh, it is uh, 23 years since it was uh, issued. And um, as, you, as you know, a lot have changed in, in 23 years uh, in our markets, in the techniques we use, in the evidence uh, we use, uh, to identify what are the boundaries of, uh, of a market. So since the past year, we have been uh, consulting widely on how to bring the notice up to date. Uh, and we plan to pu publish the results of, uh, of this evaluation uh, in the coming year. Uh, meanwhile, we're working on reviewing our antitrust guidance and rules on both vertical and horizontal agreements and we'll soon launch a public consultation to get more detailed views on the options for revising the rules on vertical agreements uh, that we set out in our inception uh, impact assessment earlier this year. Uh, and in the early part of next year, we will pu publish uh, also the result of our evaluation uh, on the horizontal rules. And the reason why I tell you about these work streams is of course that uh, competition enforcement needs to move with times. But that doesn't mean that we should ever compromise on our commitment to keep markets competitive and fair. Uh, though it seems maybe a bit like a paradox, uh, the truth is that competition makes us work together. Uh, it helps us makes, make the most of the whole economy's ability to innovate. It helps us focus on the resources, uh, helps focus our resources on the things that best brings results uh, to our whole society. Uh, and ultimately, it helps to make sure that the economy works not just for a few big companies, but the, the economy works for everyone. And that is exactly how it should be. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mrs. Vestager, for your uh, very inspiring speech. And uh, I did note, I mean, your clear message, uh, no need to reset the goals of competition, but at the same time, attention should be uh, given 
to rebooting, updating, uh, uh, modernizing, refreshing uh, our tools. Uh, and uh, you have uh, uh, very uh, eloquently shown how the EC Commission is indeed engaged into a work along those lines. Um, now, you were kind enough to accept uh, a few questions. Uh, we've got uh, uh, two or three questions. I will start with the first one, which was uh, raised by Estacio Iliopoulos, and who basically says, why is it that politicians of high popularity, and he clearly didn't mean you, but other politicians of high popularity, avoid or fail to communicate the benefits of healthy competition to the public? Is it a matter of lack of proper education and maybe a failure of advocacy on, on our part? I mean, this is something I add. Uh, or do they consider that it is not a public friendly subject? So you have been a, a politician. Uh, you, uh, I think that the question is very well directed at you. Why is it that uh, some of the most resistance, uh, the, of the biggest resistance to competition is often found in, in the political world? And is there a way in which we could make ourselves better understood? It's, um, it's a question I've been thinking about as well, um, because it would be good to have more ambassadors uh, out there, that it was more integrated in the, in the political narrative. Uh, I think there is there's a couple of, of explanations. Um, one is that when competition work, you don't think about it. You just take it for granted. Now, of course, we should have choice. Of course, we should have affordable prices. Of course, should businesses that do not deliver leave the marketplace, and those who deliver should be successful. So I think that is one explanation. The second thing is that when competition works and some companies have to leave the marketplace, uh, the pain is felt very hard on, on the people who may lose their job. Uh, understandably, uh, it's a tricky situation. It could be in a region where there may not be uh, too many uh, jobs to get. If it's a bigger company, it's a kind of a disaster for that region. While the benefits of competition, they are thinly felt by many, many people. And, and the dynamics of politics and media very often would be the people losing their job. They are the victims of competition from maybe even from abroad. Uh, and then you have a very negative narrative because then it's difficult to say, well, yes, 100 people have lost their jobs, but 5 million people are now enjoying cheaper prices on something that they may actually need. And I think that is uh, one of the dynamics of politics. But the thing is that uh, we were, we had been just been asking quite recently, uh, and actually 85% uh, uh, of, of Europeans that participated in, in this poll, they say, well, we appreciate competition. We think it's a good thing. Uh, we think that it brings us lower prices and choice. So, uh, so it may be that we actually do communicate a lot, uh, even despite of these political dynamics, uh, to show that as competition law enforcer, you really do serve, and also that you do have a political mandate, as we would all have us from, from the Treaty uh, of the European uh, Union, but everywhere, of course, we have a political, political mandate that, that reflects that there is a fundamental political support uh, for what we do. Thank you very much for this. Of course, it, it does raise, I mean, the last bit that on the poll, the fact that people support competition. When one asks them, do you support competition? Do you think it's a good thing? And people, as you said, tend to massively respond, yes. But it does raise the question of whether there's a little bit of a market failure there, a bit like when one thinks uh, about privacy or sometimes about the environment. Is there a difference between the feelings that people announce when they're asked the question and their willingness to pay for the cost of those things? In other words, uh, 
one of the costs of competition is the fact that there's more insecurity than there would be in a different system. One of the costs of uh, uh, privacy is the fact that uh, maybe you have don't have all the functionalities that uh, you enjoy. Uh, um, and on the environment, there is a bit the same question. Yes, everybody wants to have clean air, but do people actually reward the firms which are the most uh, compliant with uh, good practices there. So do you think there's a bit of a market failure or that this is not really an important issue? Well, yes and no. Um, I think uh, GG Comp uh, many years ago, they made sort of a video about uh, the neighborhood where they live and, and they went into a bakery uh, and they asked uh, the sales assistants uh, behind the counter, well, how do you feel about competition? And she said, oh, my, thanks God, we have none of that. <laughs> um, so uh, of course I can understand that from some point of view, it would be a good thing not to have competition, but I can just sort of relive my pleasure when I've had, you know, really maltreatment in the shop, you know, someone who really got the wrong le leg out of bed in the morning that I can say, okay, fine, then I will not place my business here. I will go to someone else. That, that you, you actually, you, you can do something. You have, there are actions that you can actually take. Um, so no, I, I think it's a, uh, it's a good uh, thing, but uh, obviously in, in these days, uh, it's important to, uh, to participate very actively in the debates uh, because with, for instance, the different uh, discussions about um, supply chain dependencies uh, and reshoring uh, of, uh, of businesses, uh, it's important that, that we get it right uh, so that consumers do not pay too high a price of more resilient uh, economies. And also, I think to pass the very fundamental message that if we want to recover fast and strong, well, competition is an essential. That we should really not waver. It's a, it's a fundamental mistake to say, maybe we should have a little less competition because now we need to recover. On the contrary, if we want to recover in a dynamic way, we really need competition to help us. And I think right now, it's important to be out there with the advocacy uh, for this, uh, these different um, uh, functionalities uh, of, of what competition can actually do. There was one question mm -hmm. about whether you could give a few examples of how green policies and competition can work together. Well, I think that the fundamental is obvious, uh, that competition... Uh, can work well uh, if we have the right prices uh, for companies to use as few resources as possible um, because you have uh, market signals uh, to show you, well, if I want to have affordable prices for my end customer, uh, then I definitely should use as few resources uh, as possible. So I think fundamentally uh, competition is good uh, for greening our economy or depending on the transparency uh, and the information in the marketplace for people actually being able uh, to take uh, green decisions uh, when they do their, uh, when they, they demand um, goods and services. Uh, the second thing I think is, is one of the things that are up for, for um, um, I know that, that we have been very successful with is actually to use auctions in, um, in deciding the subsidy for renewable um, uh, energy production. I was ages ago in the last millennium, uh, no, not quite, but almost uh, the speaker of my party on energy policy. And we were negotiating over a desk, the subsidy for a new windmill uh, facility, a wind, wind farm. Uh, and then the next time when a wind uh, farm had to be established, uh, it was auctioned out. Who would, who would take the smallest subsidy actually to build this? And the thing was that the subsidy was almost halved. And that sort of showed the, the cost uh, of, uh, of politicians uh, negotiating the subsidy instead of having competition in the market actually deciding the subsidy. And that we have done, I think, very successfully uh, in, in a number of, uh, of areas to use auctions and competition also when it comes to decide what should be the size of the subsidy. 
where I have uh, more questions is on, on the, the out-of-market uh, efficiencies. Uh, and this is why we are having this uh, public consultation to have some of the, the tricky points uh, debated, whether we should accept that some, uh, some uh, consumers su suffer, for instance, in terms of higher prices, because the businesses in this market, they serve the broader community uh, in a better way. Uh, and here, of course, it's a balancing act. Uh, and if we agree that we should do so, of course, we should develop a, a, a sufficiently good test that would allow us sort of to, to say, well, how much should you suffer uh, before, uh, before it's fine? Because as, as everyone knows, you cannot really compare what is useful for me with what is useful for you. Uh, that's, that doesn't really uh, go. So I think on, on, on the fundamentals, uh, we are fine with competition and, uh, and Green Deal. On other areas, we need more uh, discussion, uh, also more in depth uh, in order to get the balance right. Thank you very much. And there was one set of question uh, which has to do with your assessment of GDPR uh, on, and the relationship between GDPR and competition. And one question asked whether you think that GDPR uh, is a, a correct approach uh, to try to uh, uh, facilitate competition and privacy uh, in the digital market. And there's another one about the upcoming possible regulation on gatekeepers. Uh, and again, the question is asked, uh, are the consumers going to be uh, in charge of their own data. I mean, is there, are there ways to develop uh, this? And there was a reference to uh, PSD2, for example. I mean, do we need the new instrument of that kind? Well, on, on the first uh, question, uh, one of the things that, that I have found very inspiring and, and interesting is what the, the Bundeskartellamt uh, has done with uh, one of their Facebook cases uh, to see if, uh, if privacy was, uh, was part of, of, a, of a competition problem. Uh, so actually making people give up uh, more private um, information that they actually needed to because there was no one else to go. If you wanted to know when was the next, next uh, uh, sort of uh, training football session for your children or, or whatever it was in your community. Uh, I think it is, it is a very interesting uh, field. It's also a very tricky one uh, to get right uh, because it can be issues that are for, um, for our, our data uh, authorities uh, just as well as it can be leaning on to, to competition law enforcement. Um, I think it's very important uh, that we as competition law enforcers stay vigilant so that competition, uh, so that privacy is not used as a shield against competition. That you say, oh no, due to privacy, we can definitely not have interoperability. Uh, due to privacy, we can definitely not share these data. Where it's not about privacy, it's just about not wanting interoperability or not wanting to share data. So I, I, think, it's, I think it's important that we stay uh, vigilant uh, to, to make sure that, uh, that if privacy is used in anti-competitive uh, ways, that we actually see it uh, for what it is, uh, just uh, breaches of, of competition law. Uh, on the upcoming uh, legislation on, on gatekeepers, the Digital Markets Act, well, the idea here is that you're, of course, more than welcome to be successful uh, in, in Europe, uh, but with success, with power comes responsibility. And, um, and, and we see, of course, businesses so big, uh, literally keeping the gates uh, to certain markets and setting their own rules. Uh, and if those rules catered for fair competition, well, fair enough. But the problem is that we have now seen, not in one, not in two, but in three Google cases, the first Amazon case, uh, other cases uh, that we're investigating where we have the same suspicion, that is definitely not a given that when a gatekeeper sets the rules of the market, that these are rules that cater for fair competition. So one of the things is, of course, for, for people to be better able uh, to, to, um, to themselves uh, take action in these situations. Uh, and part of it is to be more in control of your data. 
But that is a bigger puzzle uh, than the Digital Markets Act. It, it is also the Digital Services Act coming together with a, a proposal on data governance that we produced uh, and tabled a couple of, of weeks ago, which will sort of set up the framework for intermediaries to enable uh, sharing of data and the use of data to happen in a safe environment so that you are in control of what actually happens to your data because data can be sensitive. It can be industrial data, but with grains of, um, of personal data in it. So you'll have to be very careful about it. And last but not least, uh, we will propose later next year, uh, a European digital identity. We have a European passport. I have one, I'm, it's, it's issued by the Danish state, but it's also makes me a European citizen. Sort of same kind of logic that you have a national identity that also gives you uh, sort of a, a European uh, digital identity that will allow you a much better control uh, of your data. So it is a puzzle uh, to get there to enable people uh, to get in control and to know what they want to share and what they just want to keep for themselves because it is just for them. Okay, thank you very much for that. The very last question is asked by Marcus Busy from the ACCC in Australia. And he asks, are the proposed market investigation tools intended to be a more efficient tool than enforcement? for addressing problems in market? In other words, what's the relationship between those new instruments and traditional enforcement? Substitutes or complements? Well, I think of it as a, as a complement. Um, we have made it um, a very targeted uh, tool uh, in order to, to fit it in, in the Digital Markets Act. Uh, and it is to give the Digital Markets Act a, a dynamic uh, to make it future proof. Uh, because what the Digital Markets Act will do is that it will set up a set of objective criteria. And if you're in the scope of these criteria, there will be this list of do's and this is of don't that I mentioned uh, before. But the, the world is not stable, the world is dynamic. And here indeed we need uh, the investigative tool to say, well, what is ongoing in the marketplace? Is there things that are emerging uh, to be gatekeepers where it would be better to say, well, kind of early days, you're more than welcome to be successful, but you should not grow into a gatekeeping function uh, with uh, the problems that we have seen so far that then arise uh, when a market is not contestable. Uh, and there's a reason that uh, if a, a risk that it's not fair uh, and open. So it's, it's, a more, uh, it's a more targeted uh, tool than what you would find, I think, for instance, with, uh, with the CMA uh, that has a very long experience in, in using their tool. But we have put it in uh, in order to make uh, these two things in, in the Digital Markets Act, make those things come together. Thank you very much. There are many other questions. There was one on whether competition authorities have uh, given enough attention to sustainability or whether maybe we should there uh, have an additional uh, uh, consideration to uh, uh, deal with. But you've been very generous with your time and uh, you've stayed with us uh, longer than uh, uh, you had planned to. So I really don't want to uh, uh, be too much of a nuisance because I would like you to come back in two years as usual. Uh, so thank you very much for uh, participating. Thank you very much for your message and also for being uh, so direct and precise in your answers to the questions uh, which were raised. Well, thank you very much. It was indeed a pleasure and, and I'll be looking very much uh, to get the feedback from, uh, from your discussions because they are indeed inspiring uh, for us uh, in the work that we have ahead of us. So, so thank you very much also for, for organizing and, and looking for you, forward to, to seeing you in Paris. In person. In person. <laughs> thank you thank so you. much. So this concludes the opening part of this uh, day's uh, proceeding. I would now like to uh, go to the panel um, and to introduce our uh, panel, both from the substantial uh, point of view, but also to introduce the panelists who are going to uh, try to uh, talk with us. So in terms of the panelists, and unfortunately, uh, Professor Baguati was unable to join us today for health reasons. But we're fortunate to have a very distinguished panel of six experts, 
Bill Kovacic, no need to introduce him, uh, professor of law and policy at the uh, Computational Law Center, George Washington University. Diana Moss, who's the president of the American Antitrust Institute, and she needs to be commended because she had to get up incredibly early. She's in Colorado, so it's uh, still very early. Thank you for being with us. Damien Noven, who is professor of economics at the Graduate Institute of International and Development Studies in Geneva, and he's also a senior academic advisor for Compass Lexicon. Uh, Hiroshi Ozahashi, who is the dean of the Graduate School of Public Policy, Professor of Economics at the University of Tokyo. Tendo Villakazi, who is the Executive Director of the Center for Competition Regulation and Economic Development uh, at the University of Johannesburg. And Kristen Wilson, Commissioner of the US Federal Trade Commission. So we have a, a wide uh, set of uh, uh, experts who are going to uh, talk to us. And I think that there are seven questions that we would like to uh, would like to ask them. Um, the first one is: um, Is the higher concentration that is observed, sometimes with higher markups, a sign of the fact that competition has declined or is declining? And if so, does it mean that there has been a failure somewhere of competition uh, uh, or competition policy? Second. How should we think about the relationship between competition policy and industrial policy? Those fields have been very separate up to now. Uh, clearly, there is a return of the idea of competition policy. How could we complement uh, uh, industrial policy with competition policy, competition policy with industrial policy? Third question is whether globalization has been mismanaged, as has been argued by some uh, economists. Um, created an uneven uh, field of competition. And therefore, what should we do as competition authorities or what should we do when we think about competition policy to try to uh, make things right? The next question is, uh, we've had a decade or so, a bit more than a decade of discussion about public interest goals in competition law. And we know that many countries have such public interest goals. Now, what have we learned about the inclusion of public interest goals in competition law from the, the past experience? Um, the uh, following question is whether the economic interpretation of competition law, which has dominated the field of competition for the last uh, uh, 20 years, I would say, is it illegitimate? And there are some people who argue that uh, competition law was never meant by legislators to be economics and that therefore the economy somehow have taken over the field uh, in, uh, in, in an undue uh, way. The next to last question is whether if we believe that uh, uh, economics should inspire competition law, whether the consumer welfare standard has been too rigidly enforced or whether there are possible ways to interpret this consumer welfare standard, which are more flexible than uh, what has been the traditional uh, approach. And finally, the question which was already raised of whether we are up to the challenge uh, of the digital economy. So I'm going to turn to those experts to try to see what their feelings are on each one of those questions. Uh, each question will be led by one speaker, but uh, I will allow for, oh yeah, I will not only allow, but I will hope that uh, there will be a little bit of discussion uh, uh, from the other experts on each of the topic. So let me start with the first one. Is competition declining as evidenced by higher concentration and higher markups? And to begin this discussion, I would like to turn to Professor uh, Hohashi, uh, who has been studying increasing concentration in Japan and has some ideas about what the explanation could be for this trend. Professor Hohashi, you have the floor. Uh, thank you very much. Can, can you hear? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much uh, for the introduction, Chair Jenny. And also, uh, it's my honor to participate uh, the OECD 
Global Forum, virtually from Tokyo, to contribute uh, to the discussion from the Asian side. Um, we cannot fully really discuss uh, whether we need a reset for competition policy without touching upon today's fast moving digitalization. Since, you know, as, as you know, uh, uh, Chair Jenny said, you know, the digitalization turned out to be an agenda later in the panel. So let me be brief on the first page. Um, it's now not a scientific fiction that cyberspace and physical space are closely integrated. Humans are no longer a sole decision maker as systems are continuously adjusted and monitor in real time and humans and machines collaborate each other. This is really happening in the manufacturing line uh, in some sector and we will see more and more of these day by day. Um, there are many voices here and there that our privacy is intruded or our liberty is constrained and which call for a new way to govern the digital economy. Uh, looking back to history, we have seen at least three types of governance regimes. The first type is a state regulation through uh, industrial policy. Since the economy is confronted with many market failures, the government should intervene and correct for the failures uh, for the benefit of society. Uh, the, the conventional type of industrial policy includes uh, in fact, industry products by protection by tariffs or expo promotion through uh, state substance. The second type is to rely on uh, market mechanism. Uh, this view is that contrary to, to the first view of uh, some omnipotent you know, government, the state also may fail. And the damage caused by government failures are much more uh, greater than the market failures. Uh, this view drives a market liberalization and deregulation and also push it toward a smaller role of government. The third type is a new governance regime that we are struggling to come up with in the, the today digitalized era. In a way, stage three is a hybrid of industrial policy and competition policy. The view is that uh, there is a role that the government can play to function the market better. Uh, several hybrid types have been proposed and implemented including exper uh, experimental regulations, responsive regulations, and co-regulations. All are not quite mutually exclusive, but depending on the case we may, have, we may have, we pick and choose the most appropriate combination of these hybrid forms. I believe we will come back to this later in the panel. When identifying uh, harmful conducts, competition authority must deal with two problems. One is a pacing problem where the enforcement must catch up with the pace of innovations. The second is a coordination problem where the data doesn't concern about the boundary of defined market, but rather connect beyond various markets. These two problems pose uh, several challenges such as uh, multi-sided markets or zero prices, algo uh, mythic uh, matching and uncertainty in the consequence of enforcement. Let me now leave the conceptual discussion and move on to the empirics on concentration markups that uh, the, the Chair Jenny you know, kindly introduced me to. Uh, I think uh, two countries here, Japan and US, and uh, uh, perhaps uh, many of you are familiar with the US evidence, but Japan also showed some degree of uh, increasing concentration over the years, over the decade. And page six, uh, this is the average trend of corporate markups for both Japan and 20, 27 countries reported in the uh, IMF, uh, International Monetary Fund. Uh, corporate markups increased for, for many countries, but if we use the same method estimating production function, Japan's markup remained flat and stagnant. Uh, to see the variance of them, I took the top 10% of the markup distribution and compare with the rest. The right-hand side is, uh, is indicate uh, the US and other countries experienced high markup, you know, higher markups firm gain higher markups. So, you know, big, big companies 
uh, grow bigger. But I don't see any coherent trend in Japan's markup on the right hand side. Uh, I think you know, we could uh, come up with several hypotheses why Japan's markups uh, looks as I show you. And I select three of them. Uh, the first hypothesis is that, that Japan's markets are on, on average competitive. Uh, this might be because you know, Japan entered the declining aging uh, domestic markets. And since the, the supply adjustment is slow, the, the market is relatively oversupplied rather than short supply. The, the second hypothesis is that J Japan suffered from the lack of new products and services that make it difficult to differentiate their products. And the third hypothesis are digitalization. The first hypothesis is visualized, I think, this way. Uh, the observed markup can be decomposed into two types of markups. One is a markup due to anti-competitive conduct, and the other markup is due to uh, uh, product differentiation, if we think about oligopolistic market. To identify which hypothesis is more appropriate, uh, we, we must separate you know, H1 markups from the H2 markups by use of econometrics, which I don't discuss here today. And, and the third hypothesis is on digitalization, the presence of uh, uh, digital platforms. The, the mark of Japan is flat, perhaps because uh, they don't reflect the profits earned by digital platforms, which are most likely transferred out of country, or the second, uh, because uh, digital platforms exercise monopoly, monopoly power, buyer's power over the domestic SMEs. Uh, the first, uh, the, the, the item is uh, related with uh, international taxations. And, and to cope with the second one, uh, Japan seek for co-regulation, uh, some kind of co pro-competitive type of industrial policy to cope with this, this issue. And I, I think I, I'm gonna come back to this later in this panel. Uh, my final word is that uh, since the digitalization cut across various boundaries, administrative boundary, sectoral boundaries, and jurisdictional boundaries, uh, authority also works together to respond to digitalization. And I believe that the OECD is the best platform to do the work best. Uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Hoshi, uh, for this. So you seem to indicate that uh, uh, even though Japan has seen an increase in concentration, it hasn't seen an increase in necessarily uh, in uh, market power. Uh, and that if that's the case, maybe it means that there hasn't been a, a particular failure of competition or competition law enforcement in Japan. I would like to try to turn to the co-panelists. And by the, by the way, there's one thing which uh, uh, I've just uh, been uh, aware of. Uh, if you click on the participant list uh, at the bottom, you will find a function which is raise your hand. So that's, I'm talking to the panelists. So that may be the way in which uh, you we want to communicate so I can give you the floor. And I see that Kristen Wilson has raised her hand. So I will give her the floor immediately on this issue. Uh, in the US, the debate has been very uh, uh, strong on whether there was a market failure because of a higher, uh, so Kristen, you have the floor. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Fred. So uh, you're absolutely right that we have had a significant debate on this topic in the United States. And, uh, and part of the debate is a very robust literature indicating the significant flaws in some of the earlier studies indicating that there is higher concentration and that there are higher markups. Uh, I'd like to add another point. Obviously, I think it's important to distinguish between products where consumers have a range of price options and those where they do not. Product differentiation is a good thing. And so in some instances, a consumer goods company with a strong brand reputation may be able to obtain relatively higher margins while a retailer's store brand will have a lower price point and a lower margin. And obviously we have differences in margins depending on the, the quality. So quality adjusted prices matter as well. 
But in the U.S., we see higher prices and higher margins without lower cost alternatives consistently where regulatory regimes and rent seeking are prevalent. So uh, particularly in the healthcare sector in the United States, there are state laws that limit entry and expansion into the healthcare services sector and immunize healthcare providers' cooperation and immunize their mergers from antitrust scrutiny. And there is no lower margin equivalent of the store brand in these markets. Patients and insurers simply have to pay the higher prices that result from reduced output. So, so stepping back, I understand the concern that people around the world uh, are losing faith in capitalism. We have spent a lot of time discussing this issue uh, over, over the last two or three years. I submit to you the real problem is crony capitalism. Capitalism, uh, which I'll define as a system in which the production of goods and services is based on supply and demand in the market, rather than through central planning, is what we hope to achieve. In that system, government intervenes only where necessary to address market failures. In contrast, crony capitalism is a system in which the lobbyists and other special interests engage in rent seeking and legislators end up picking winners and losers. And in that system, people who are not favored by the rule makers see no, no better way to live their lives. Now, the FTC has a, a very strong and robust competition advocacy program. It encourages federal, state, and local municipalities to roll back these kinds of restraints on competition that come at the hands of rent seeking. And, uh, and I would submit that the right approach is not to give up hope for antitrust and capitalism, but to clear away the obstacles to free market competition that government has created. I think that is the low hanging fruit for us to take action on. Okay, thank you very much for this very clear statement. Uh, let me turn to uh, another raised hand, Diana Moss. Diana, you have the floor. There we go. My apologies. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure and an honor to be with this group today. Um, I just want to uh, chime in a bit on the on the uh, question about rising concentration. Uh, I, there's a growing body of literature out there uh, through engagement uh, now in in pretty much all sectors of the economics community and the public policy community. We've got macroeconomists involved in in doing studies on uh, on markups and effects on wages and inequality. We have labor economists who are actively doing empirical analysis. Uh, I wish the industrial organization economists would become more active in this because they play a really critical role. And that is in connecting uh, the broader findings about rising concentration to uh, antitrust enforcement. And it's a very important connection to be made. And, and uh, you know, I encourage uh, industrial organization economists to take that, take that challenge. I also think that, so we can't ignore the implications for broader uh, uh, findings on rising concentration and their connection to antitrust enforcement. That is a big open question that must be addressed. Second, I, I just wanna point out that we don't need a lot of empirical studies to, to prove that we have rising concentration, at least in the United States. We're now down to three uh, wireless carriers. Uh, if you look at the FTC's record on pharmaceutical mergers, for example, over 60% of markets were four to three mergers or mergers to monopoly. Uh, we have domestic cartels and beef packing and, um, and other protein processing. And this has occurred over a period of time where there has been a diminution of competition uh, through fairly lax merger control. So I, I don't think we should ignore the evidence that is, is really lying on the ground in front of us um, and, and also encourage uh, a more empirical analysis specifically that links uh, uh, trends in rising concentration to uh, what has gone on in antitrust enforcement. Okay, thank you very much for this dissenting view. Um, so, one thing, uh, one takeaway from this uh, little discussion is the fact that uh, maybe it is that uh, uh, concentration and margins are like cholesterol. I mean, there's good concentration or good 
uh, uh, important margin because they are due to innovation, differentiation, uh, and uh, thing. And there is bad cholesterol, which may be or bad uh, uh, margins, which may come from rent-seeking regulations or possibly the lack of uh, competition enforcement. What is noticeable, though, is that uh, we have three different regimes, Europe, the US, and Japan. Uh, it cannot be said that uh, competition law enforcement has been the same, uh, no matter which uh, uh, index uh, you take. Um, and yet, uh, there is a rise in concentration in all three. And as Professor uh, uh, Ohashi uh, suggested, there may be various uh, uh, alternative explanations. So it seems to, that, uh, as uh, Diana said, more studying is required, more empirical analysis maybe, but one shouldn't go too far in saying that it is there is one cause that explains uh, the rise in concentration and the rise in, in margin. And it's not even obvious that uh, the rise in concentration or the rise in margin is always bad. It may be bad, but, uh, but we need more facts before we can uh, uh, have a definitive opinion. So let me turn now to the second issue that I wanted to raise, um, the issue of how can we mix competition policy and industrial policy. In many countries in the world, because of the need to reallocate resources for uh, uh, whether it's for uh, the green economy or for the digital economy or to relocate uh, uh, value chains, there is more and more talk about the government being more assertive and having a more active industrial policy, as well as, for example, uh, to uh, counter the uneven uh, global field that we will talk about uh, later on. Um, I'm struck personally by the fact that competition authorities have been very discreet on industrial policy. They, if they say anything, well, they tend to say that it's a bad way to intervene or that it's very risky and they can be all all kinds of interventions which are uh, uh, not, uh, uh, which are going to reduce competition. But should we do more to try to draw the attention of policymaker on what would be a pro-competitive industrial policy? Do we have examples of what could be a pro-industrial, uh, pro-competitive industrial policy? And should we be more active on this, uh, uh, on this debate? Let me turn to Bill for this. Thank you, Fred, and uh, my gratitude uh, for the opportunity to participate and my further gratitude to James Mancini and his colleagues in the Secretariat for organizing the session. There are so many ways in which governments create what Mansur Olson once described as an enabling environment for competition. They give subsidies, they spend money on the in development of human capital, they invest in research and development. Uh, they create an intellectual property system that determines who gets rights. Uh, we have to start by defining, I think, what we mean by industrial policy. And arguably, all of these are ingredients of the competitive environment. One of the most important, in which I think there has been a longstanding engagement with competition agencies and government policymakers, one dimension of industrial policy is public procurement. I think competition agencies for a long time have understood that the operation of the procurement system can have a decisive effect on the competitive environment for goods and services. And there has been an active program of cooperation, which this committee, I think, has documented certainly over the last 20 to 25 years. Uh, so there has been an intimate connection. I'm going to give you a story about how I think it's worked in an area that's not entirely visible. So much of the discussion these days about competition is so mournful. You would think that the apocalypse is right around the corner because nothing has worked. Uh, let's talk about an example where arguably industrial policy and competition policy did work. I'm going to talk about rocket science, heavy launch vehicles. In 2006, 2007, the FTC allowed the creation of a joint venture between the only two US producers of launch vehicles for national security launches. Lockheed Martin and Boeing combined an organization called the United Launch Alliance. That's called a merger to monopoly. That was two to one. Sounds pretty grim, doesn't it? There was, an, a, power, there was a powerful efficiency story behind it. 
that the decision of the FTC to proceed depended in part upon the apparent aspiration of the government purchasers to encourage entry. And entry was the decisive question in the entire transaction. A crucial starting point was to build the awareness on the part of the public purchasers that the way in which they spent money could have a crucial impact on their choices in the future. And the basic question and the FTC's engagement with the National Aeronautics and Space Administration and the Department of Defense was, what's going to happen when the day comes when you're dependent on a single supplier and they don't try so hard? They're not imaginative, they're not inventive. What are you going to do when you're stuck with one? And you'd better start thinking right now about alternatives. Especially at NASA, that message struck a responsive chord. And NASA began at the end of that decade and onward to think, how do we expand the supplier base with the resources we have to encourage entry? And there were a couple of new tech companies that were interested in this. What were the new tech companies bringing to the party? One, they saw that there were breathtaking advances in materials that could be used in building launch vehicles at a much lower cost. They saw there was breathtaking advances in digitization, electronics. It would make it possible to design a new launch vehicle from the ground up with none of the preconceptions that the incumbent suppliers had used. And that there were new techniques for the operation and management of launch services themselves. And who was the company that thought of this? It was a guy named Elon Musk, who creates a company in 2001 called SpaceX. And mind you, this is an area in which you would think that entry and expansion by a new firm is impossible. You want the highest barriers to entry that exist. These are as high as the sky itself. This was an improbable story, yet NASA took conscious steps with a company that saw the possibility of doing this from scratch and saying, what happens if we had launch vehicles that could land, descend to Earth and land and you could use them again? What would happen if we had a new method of fueling that said you wouldn't fuel the system until 10 minutes before you launched? And that as a result, you could have a much higher tempo of launches. NASA said, we will invest by giving you more opportunities to launch vehicles for us. SpaceX has gone from nowhere in 2001. Oh, by the way, he had some other idea about an electric car, but he got to that too. SpaceX went from zero in 2001 to what is arguably the most successful, the most innovative space launch vehicle producer today. And that is what you can see when you look at what they've done by way of sending human beings to the International Space Station. And you see when you watch those clips, every single innovation they have. You look at the interior of the Crew Dragon capsule. That's a video game, basically, with human beings using screens instead of flipping switches and dials in a vehicle that was state of the art from the ground up a new innovative entrant. Some lessons from this. One, the advocacy and engagement of the public competition agency with the government agencies that are spending the money, and oh, by the way, they spend a lot of money in all of our economies, to find public agency officials who said a strategic approach to creating options is really valuable for us especially if we think we've gotten bad performance in the past. Second, what was necessary? Risk-taking. Risk-taking on the part of the public authority, the competition agency to say, yes, there's a good efficiency story here, but this transaction only makes sense ultimately if there is an entry possibility and how do we encourage it to develop over time? And again, this is an area in which the public agencies in the US have been so attuned to high tech, to innovation. The notion that they were blind to these consider considerations is such a myth. And it is the interest in that that drove the engagement with NASA and the Department of Defense. Third, you needed public procurement officials who were entrepreneurial, 
who are willing to take risks, think strategically and encourage entry. And the consequence has been all of the exciting developments on the frontier of launch vehicles are happening with firms that were not in the business 20 years ago. And it is spilling over into areas such as drones, the recreation of a capability for supersonic passenger transport. Those are almost all companies that were not active in the field before. And they're all riding on the ascent of new materials, electronic technologies, digitization, but crucially, public procurement authorities who thought we can spend the money in ways over time that open the door for innovation, including, for example, by giving prizes to successful designs. Going back to the idea that brought Lindbergh across the Atlantic Ocean in 1927, he was chasing a cash prize. Public procurement authorities developing strategies. So as you think about how the world has gone to hell and is traveling faster into the abyss, turn on your computer, watch the SpaceX launches and just realize that didn't exist 20 years ago. And it's come about because of deliberate public policy choices. That's industrial policy on a really good day. Thanks. Thank you very much for this very interesting story. And uh, um, let me turn to Tando uh, Vinakazi to give a perspective from South Africa uh, or, or in general from uh, rebuilding developing economies and the, the respective role of competition policy and industrial policy in that regard. So Tando. Thanks, Chair. Um, and, and thanks for Bill. I think he, he did the heavy lifting in terms of what I might have <laughs> to say on this. Uh, and of course, very appreciative of the opportunity to speak on, on these issues. Um, I think I'll, I'll just make two or three kind of um, overarching points on this issue. I think that um, uh, we, we kind of have to remind ourselves again here that if, if the objectives of, of competition law, competition policy, etc., are to protect the competitive process, to ensure that markets work, et cetera, um, and that we see rivalrous outcomes, we have to accept that those outcomes cannot only result from the decisions taken by competition authorities. When economies are such complex creatures, right? They rely on uh, not only the interventions of competition authorities, but also what your sector, regu sector specific regulators are doing. They rely on, on what rules are being set that govern the interactions between firms at a sector or industry level, and not only the decisions that competition authorities make on mergers, for instance, right? And so this is all part of one picture. And to the extent that you have competition authorities actually involved in some, some of these similar activities, so uh, 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 making decisions about the structure of industry going, of particular industries going forward, making certain decisions about pricing outcomes, for instance, through various remedies uh, in specific industries, I would argue that, and I think it's, it's, it's certainly debatable, that um, competition authorities have always been doing industrial policy, and so we shouldn't be so uncomfortable, right? You're changing the, the trajectory or the economic outcomes in a particular industry through various decisions that you make. And so it's not about either or, it's a question about um, how best to do it, I would argue. I think what's important about what competition law brings to the kind of debates on, on, on industrial policy, et cetera, and even in the context of COVID-19, is that competition authorities have not necessarily a unique position, but a very important position in that they have an ability to understand the details of markets probably better than, 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 than various policy departments or government departments making public policy choices. Uh, competition authorities understand the nature of barriers, what it takes to compete, what uh, entry conditions need to apply to enable entry, et cetera, right? And so in that way, they contribute and can contribute working alongside effective industrial policy quite a bit in terms of, of actually um, achieving what is ultimately the objective of these pro-developmental market outcomes, right? Um, and I would add that are actually beneficial to citizens. So we don't do competition law for its own sake, but we do it to the extent that it helps to, uh, to, to make markets deliver in my context for the poor. Um, and if they're not doing that, then, then what are we doing? And I think that's the hard question to answer. Um, I'll leave it there. Thank you very much uh, for this. Uh, I see that Damien uh, wants to add to this. So Damien, you have the floor. 
Yes, thank you very much. Um, and uh, thank you very much to, uh, to the OECD also for inviting me to participate in this. So just um, a, a brief comment uh, that actually builds on a couple of things that the commissioner has said earlier. I mean, the commissioner has uh, focused uh, in her uh, speech on the link. Damien, can you yeah. speak closer to your microphone? Closer to the microphone, okay. Thank you. Uh, so one of the um, uh, element in the uh, presentation of the commissioner uh, earlier uh, today was on the link between competition enforcement and uh, environmental protection. And she said, I think two things that are very important. The first thing is that uh, competition enforcement works best and competition works best in general when the prices are right. I was actually surprised to hear the commissioner said that. Uh, and, um, and, and it is you know, a fundamental insight that uh, competition actually work when the, uh, the the framework for industrial policy is uh, is clear, so that uh, there is a clear complementarity there. I mean, industrial policy works best when you have uh, competitive interactions. The second thing that uh, the commissioner referred to is her concern uh, about sort of overextending uh, the uh, concerns about. Uh, environmental protection in competition cases. And uh, you probably noticed that uh, she, she made a reference to out of market efficiencies. And uh, I think that th this concern about out of market efficiency, I think reflects um, a general concern about taking into account uh, environmental goals or environmental protection in competition enforcement, because it involves a mix of objectives. I mean, think for instance about the 101 case, the 101 free case uh, in which uh, an agreement has consequences for competition, but also has consequences for environmental protection. I mean, do you want to take the consequences for the protection of the environment into account in the overall assessment? And uh, uh, the, the concern there is that if you have multiple objectives, uh, at the end of the day, uh, it's difficult to reach a decision which is for which the agencies can be accountable. Uh, the problem is that with multiple objectives, you open up the, the scope for, for capture. And I think that we should remember where we are coming back from uh, in, in Europe. I mean, we are coming back from the 1990s, an environment in which enforcement was much less predictable than it currently is. I mean, enforcement is now much more predictable because we have developed analytical tools, because we have developed metrics in order to be able to, to compare alternatives. And the concern about introducing other objectives uh, like environmental protection is that you lose this predictability, this ability to compare alternatives according to a, to a clear metric. And so it seems to me that uh, in line with what the commissioner said earlier is that this is a good idea as long as two conditions are met. The first condition is that there is a common metric that you can actually look at the consequences for the consumers in terms of competition, but also in terms of environmental protection, according to a common metric. And second, that whatever objective you take into account, in addition to competition, actually fits into an existing framework. Okay, Tando, you wanted to react. Yeah, maybe just to, to add here, I'm um, sure, I mean, I, I think that uh, and, and I take the point that it is important also to build in um, this kind of certainty, the ability to attach a metric uh, that allows for, for effective and objective decision making. But I think that it's also important to consider that if, 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 if even those metrics or even those considerations don't account for the broader socioeconomic or, or environmental or industry context in which that particular competition law has been, is be, uh, decision has been taken, then you might be missing an important part of the picture here. And I'll, I'll give you a sense of, of where I'm coming from. I think in the countries that we that our research center does quite a bit of work on, and um, we've just done a book on barriers to entry in the South African economy. Um, and, and what's abundantly clear from those case studies is that we have a very effective competition law regime uh, uh, that has done quite a bit in terms of dealing with strategic barriers and, and anti-competitive conduct in sectors. And we did research to focus on well, what happened after the competition law interventions across economic sectors, from banking to, to grain milling, et cetera. And what's become really clear is that even where you had very effective competition law interventions, 
Um, it wasn't until you also had follow up or complementary industrial policy or public policy interventions that you started to see entrants emerge. Um, and I think in our environment where capital markets don't function necessarily as well as one might hope, these things become important. And so I think it's certainly in the developing country context and I might argue elsewhere as well, uh, it's not helpful to separate these issues out for the sake of the experience of having clear uh, uh, metrics uh, that are objective. Um, I think the world is, is certainly a far more colorful place than that. Okay, thank you very much uh, for this. Bill, very short. Uh, as, uh, as, as Damien was just saying, and uh, as, as, as Tando, I think, is also suggesting, this all puts a premium on the clarity with which policymakers are willing to describe what they've done and not to hide trade-offs that they're making. I think it requires a degree of honesty and clarity that is very hard to achieve in practice. Uh, I think that the Competition Commission of South Africa has strived perhaps more than any other to put its cards face up on the table to describe what it's doing, uh, but, to, but to lay out the methodology, the metrics as Damian was describing it, and then to talk about how you actually applied them requires a degree of confidence that's uh, I think hard to achieve because the trade-offs in many instances are gonna be so hard and there's an enormous temptation to mask them. Uh, in order to in order to issue a decision that, that accomplishes a goal, but you're not quite sure about how to do it. So, but the whatever you're going to do, you owe it to the larger public to, as they would say in a math exam, to show your work. Okay, thank you very much for that. So, I think that what comes out of this exchange is uh, first of all the fact that there are complementarities between competition and industrial policy. Uh, the second one is that <clears throat> the idea is not to introduce industrial policy goals into competition policy for the reasons that uh, uh, Damien in particular has mentioned, but more to introduce competition uh, uh, dimension into industrial policy, which is what Bill and uh, Tendo, I think, uh, have been uh, talking about. And there, it seems to me that some of the indications that were given by Bill were quite important for example, to convince policy, industrial policymakers that they need to have strategic options so that uh, they can maintain an element of competition within their industrial policy design, or the same thing for uh, the public procurement, uh, is uh, uh, quite important. All this being very transparent and uh, uh, and uh, uh, I think there that uh, uh, what Bill said at the very end and. And the example of South Africa is uh, quite clear uh, from that point of view. Okay, thank you very much. Let me turn to the next question. The next question is basically sourced from the idea that globalization has given a Biden name to competition uh, for a lot of people. Because a lot of people, I felt that they've been, uh, they've been uh, disfavored uh, in the international competition. And it is, it is true. Uh, that uh, we have competition on world market between firms that come from very different environment. And some of them are state supported. They have plenty of subsidies. Um, and what they do is that they conquer markets. Uh, they displace firms in other countries, which think that uh, with people thinking that it was unfair that they were displaced. So let me turn to Damien, uh, first of all, because he's got a vast uh, knowledge of uh, uh, trade policy. But turn around, uh, turn around and to say, if we have a very uneven uh, field in international competition, what can competition policy or competition authorities do to redress it? Or should it come through other uh, areas from than competition policy, regulation, for example? Damien. Damien, we cannot hear you. We cannot hear you. Can you hear me now? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So thank you very much uh, for, for this question. Um, now, what I'd like to do is to indeed highlight the, the significance of the extent to which uh, the, uh, the, the playing field is currently unleveled. And, uh, 
in thinking about this, I think it's useful to first have a definition. What do we mean by uh, playing field being leveled? And uh, uh, in talking about the, the playing field, we are essentially talking about opportunities for firms that are located or coming from different uh, jurisdictions that are coming from different countries. So it's really a discussion about different opportunities and uh, in particular different market access. And as you pointed out in your uh, initial introduction, one of the concern is about subsidies, is about the fact that some firms will receive subsidies and will compete in global markets with firms that do not receive subsidies. And of course, we are not concerned about short-term effects. I mean, we are concerned about the long-term effects of support such that firms that are supported might be in a position because of dynamic scale economies that are becoming ever more important to uh, dominate markets or to establish uh, a strong position in, uh, in global markets. And the first observation to make is that the WTO regime on subsidies is really not adequate uh, so that we cannot rely on the WTO regimes with respect to subsidies. It has problems in terms of design. As we know, I mean, this is a regime in which uh, there is no justification for subsidies that are uh, currently allowed in terms of market failures or in terms of public policy objective. The WTO regime is not implemented um, because member countries are supposed to report, are supposed to notify about subsidies and they routinely don't. And also because the WTO regimes only cover um, subsidies which affect exports in goods market. So there is a very narrow scope of the, uh, of the WTO regimes. Now, having said this, I mean, there are some countries, and of course here China is one of them, in which the, the state is providing lots of support to uh, state-owned enterprises in particular, and these subsidies affect competition globally uh, in terms of competition uh, in the market. And um, I mean, this, is, this has been widely documented and in particular by the OECD, so I'm not going to spend, uh, to spend time on this. But it's also worth observing that subsidies will affect competition for particular assets and competition for markets. And here, just to take up a couple of examples uh, again, I mean, when Syngenta was acquired by ChemChina, uh, ChemChina had a very poor finance. I mean, it certainly did not have the finance such that it could embark into a major uh, international acquisition, and it was provided direct financing by, uh, by SASAC. If you look at the acquisitions that are undertaken by Chinese firms in, uh, in the EU, 90% of them actually uh, originate from uh, state-owned enterprises. So that, I mean, there, there is a, a concern about how subsidies affect the opportunities in international competition. There is also a concern about how regimes with respect to foreign direct investment affect opportunities for firms uh, competing globally. Um, and this is because some countries have a regime for authorizing foreign direct investment such that these authorizations are actively managed and possibly actively managed in such a way as to optimize transfers of technology. I mean, let me just give an example here again. I mean, 10 years ago, uh, investment in China for, for trains and high-speed trains uh, were sort of heavily favored, were heavily encouraged within the nomenclature of the, of the Chinese government. Currently, I mean, the, um, the situation for trains has uh, switched to a situation in which the investments are no longer encouraged, possibly because the technology uh, has, been, uh, has been transferred. But the consequence of that, of course, is that um, foreign firms do not have access to what is uh, currently the largest market for trains, and in particular, the largest market for, for high-speed trains. So this is another instance in which opportunities are being tilted by the uh, regimes of, uh, of foreign direct investment. The final policy dimension in which uh, opportunities are being, are being denied or are not, are not equal is respect to the strategic enforcement of competition rule. And that comes sort of closer to, to the question you were putting forward. And here, it appears that the, the Chinese government, at least in some instances, I mean, has taken decisions on uh, enforcement um, in a way which would appear 
to try to prevent the emergence of international firms that were competitive. And the best example here is the, uh, the prohibition, the effective prohibition of the P3 alliance by the, uh, by the Chinese uh, government. Another example which concerns the same market is the imposition of remedies uh, to favor Chinese firms in the Marx hamburger suit um, acquisition. And all of that, I mean, this sort of strategic enforcement by the Chinese authority is taking place in an environment in which the Chinese authorities are also encouraging the consolidation of domestic firms. I mean, there is a long list um, which has been sort of well documented about the um, the domestic consolidation that have been encouraged by the, by the Chinese authorities. Now, you might say, why does that matter? Well, that matters because these um, large domestic acquisitions uh, are actually preventing uh, foreign competitors from, again, having access to the Chinese market. I mean, one of the best way of entering a, a foreign market for uh, non-Chinese firms would have been indeed to make an acquisition in the Chinese market, which are currently uh, denied by the uh, strategic enforcement of the, what can be characterized as a strategic enforcement by the uh, Chinese authorities. So I mean, this lack of a level playing field, I think is becoming a concern. And the, the EU white paper has uh, started to address this. Now, the concern I have with the uh, EU white paper is that it's actually narrow in focus. I mean, the EU white paper uh, focuses on distortions that are the consequence of subsidies being granted by foreign government, which leads to distortion in the internal market. But this actually misses a lot of the action because all of the support that affects the competitiveness of firms in the domestic market, say subsidies to Chinese firms in China, or indeed subsidies that will affect the operation of Chinese firms outside uh, China in third markets, but do not have an impact, do not lead to a distortion in the, uh, in the internal market, actually outside the, uh, the scope of the white paper. Now, arguably, I mean, the, the EU is also trying to address these issues through you know, active implementation of the uh, anti-subsidy agreement in the WTO. But as I said earlier, I mean, this is somewhat uncertain given the, uh, the inherent limitations of that, uh, of that framework. So I think that one concern about the, uh, uh, the white paper is that it might lead to diversion effect. I mean, so that in order to avoid the, the, the control that the EU regime, might, EU regime might implement or might lead to, it will lead foreign governments to rather support firms in domestic markets or support domestic firms that operate in third market and as a consequence, and export to the export to the EU. The other uh, limitation of the EU. Sorry, if you could just wrap up. Thank yeah, you. Just one minute, uh, less than one minute. The other concern about the EU uh, white paper is that it's not concerned with FDI. It's not concerned with the strategic enforcement of competition rules. So that the consequence is again a diversion. Instead of tilting the level playing field through subsidies, there will be an incentive to keep tilting the uh, playing field through other instruments like strategic enforcement. So what is the, you know, the lesson for competition enforcement? Uh, I mean, clearly, I mean, it would be a concern if the EU would be starting to do the same thing as the Chinese authorities in terms of strategic enforcement for the reasons that I mentioned earlier. One of the main achievements of uh, the last uh, 20 years has been to make enforcement predictable. At the same time, in order to make the level playing field even, you need to be tough. I mean, you need to signal clearly that something has to change in, the, uh, in international relations. And from that perspective, I mean, the recent decision by the Bundeskartell arm with respect to the, the Voslo uh, acquisition, so the acquisition of Voslo by the uh, Chinese uh, train manufacturer is, is a bit of a disappointment. I mean, you see is that, I mean, in the, in the end, the, the Bundeskartellamt has allowed the acquisition, uh, but after a decision that over 10 pages is explaining how much of a problem it is to have a foreign, and in particular, a Chinese acquisition of uh, locomotives in Germany, at the end of the day, uh, the Bundeskartellamt is throwing its hands up in the air and say, okay, I mean, we don't like it. We think it's a long-term 
a problem, but we will still allow it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Demia. Let me ask you an additional question on which you haven't uh, uh, fully uh, answered uh, my question. Do you think that in the competition analysis that competition authorities do when they enforce, should they look at competition differently depending for a given structural uh, uh, structure of industry, depending on whether there are some of the players who come from an environment where they have access to a lot of facilities, uh, whereas the others do not uh, have the same. Because this is not something that one finds very often discussed in competition decision. The yeah. fact that all the players are not on an equal footing. I mean, it's very interesting you ask this question because the Voslo decision by the Bundeskartellam is one such example. I think the Bundeskartellam goes over about 10 pages explaining how much subsidies uh, CCCR is, is getting. I mean, expressing concerns about the fact that by acquiring Voslo, it might actually get a foothold into the European market, that it might start to charge low prices, it might start to build up a uh, position such that uh, it will become a dominant firm in the, in the future. So all of these concerns are expressed in the decision, but at the end of the day, they are inoperative because the Bundeskartell, I'm saying, okay, in the short term, uh, there is potentially a benefit from allowing this acquisition uh, because, I mean, essentially because of a failing front defense, because of the prospect that post law might, might, might disappear. But arguably, I mean, the long-term considerations that you're referring to could be part of that analysis or could have been play, could have played an operative role in the, uh, in the analysis and not only serve as a background. Okay, so you think that the analysis was right, but the conclusion was wrong in this case. Uh, I think that all of the elements it, were there in order to reach a different decision. Okay, Bill. <clears throat> I, I'm just uh, thinking that if we're examining our framework in terms of a reset uh, or a reboot uh, and thinking more broadly about the future, uh, Damian's comments uh, and your conversation with him, Fred, uh, bring to my mind that it is it could well be time to go back into the WTO framework and reopen the Working Group on Competition Policy and taking account of the work that's been done with the government procurement agreement that has major competition dimensions, but to make not only that working group uh, an active part of the work of this trade body, but to create as part of the research agenda with all of the sensitivities it involves, uh, many of the issues that Damian has mentioned uh, as, as integral elements of the examination of the functioning of the global trade system and uh, to make that a, a, a renewed focal point of policymaking over time, uh, I, would, I would say that if we're going to reset and rethink who should do what, uh, I would bring that back onto the agenda at the WTO. Yep. Okay. Let's hope we can revive the WTO and then we can bring new topics to, uh, or, or old topics that uh, were discontinued. Uh, it would be nice to have appointees there, yes. <laughs> Uh, let me turn to the next question, uh, which has been already, uh, oh, P Professor uh, Hohashi, you wanted to say something. Uh, actually, I, I just wanted to say that, you know, I, I fully agree with the bill uh, saying that, you know, we should, you know, go revive the WTO stuff. But, you know, uh, one thing that I'm concerned about, you know, regarding Damien's, you know, different point of view is uh, there is, you know, the tech war between, you know, major countries and also there is a national security issue that, you know, for example, we've talked about semiconductor industry, you know, national security actually distorting the free trade right now, I think. So there is, you know, also a, there is a conflict, you know, between uh, national economic security, competition policy, and, and the free trade of, you know, the international trade. And I think, you know, this is something that we should also think about resetting it. Okay. Thank you. Just a comment. Thank you. So let me turn to the next uh, topic. Uh, there have been a lot of discussion, including today, by the way, about public interest goals in competition law. Uh, there is a wide, uh, I mean, a widely distributed idea that there shouldn't be uh, too many uh, or should not be any uh, public interest goals in competition laws. 
And yet, when we look around the world, we see that uh, uh, at least half of the countries which have a competition law do have uh, public interest goals in their competition laws. So they uh, strive to promote consumer welfare and something else, whether it is uh, uh, reducing poverty or, or facilitating the development of the local firms, et cetera, et cetera. Now, uh, South Africa is, of course, one of the most notorious uh, uh, cases of a country uh, that has public interest goal in its competition law. And David Lewis uh, famously said once that if there hadn't been a public, in or public interest goals written into the South African competition law, there would not have been any competition law at all because legislators would not have been interested. Um, now, um, I wanted to uh, ask uh, Tandy, uh, looking back over uh, uh, nearly two decades of competition law in uh, South Africa with public interest uh, uh, goals, what do you say uh, now those public interest goals have to do with uh, uh, the employment, with the ability of small businesses or firm controlled by historically disadvantaged persons uh, to become competitive, the ability of national industries to compete internationally. What, one thing that we should say uh, right from the beginning is that South Africa, as has been mentioned earlier, has been extremely transparent in how it was going to look at those public interest uh, 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 provision in its competition law. So that has uh, uh, made it much more predictable and therefore easier uh, for uh, the people who were conceivably uh, uh, would come under the law. But I, I would like to ask Tando, what is your assessment of what this has achieved? I mean, has have the competition decision actually significantly uh, allowed uh, the reaching of those goals or are competition decision because they are on small cases and not uh, macroeconomic decision are really not very well fit to develop uh, public interest goals or to reach public interest goals. So Tendo. Thanks, Eric. Um, I'll, I'll say a few uh, uh, things about this and maybe just to, to note again that, that I'll, I'll be speaking largely in my, in my personal capacity, but also informed by, by the research that, that you've certainly done on, on some of these issues and other authors as well. Um, I think that the, 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 the reference that you make to Dave Lewis's remarks are, are quite, it's quite important here, which is that uh, in many ways, and certainly in the South African case, the, the issue and the prominence of the public interest issues uh, in, in the act, uh, I would argue are actually a very important part or source of the political legitimacy of the competition regime. The fact that the authorities can now operate largely independently and, 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 and as long as they're particularly transparent and I think they've been particularly good at this. Um, there is an association with the fact that they, um, or the fact that they, they consider some of these broader objectives um, in principle, but also specifically in the public interest provisions. Um, I think it actually allows them the room to some extent to actually uh, do the work that they do, right? And, and so I think that, um, uh, the track record, I think, is something that needs to be assessed in a lot more detail in terms of how significant these outcomes have been. So um, after all this effort to get the public interest provisions into the Act and the various revisions and now the guidelines that, that are relatively recent, um, I think your question is, is, is spot on in terms of, well, are we getting anywhere with this? Is it worth other countries going as far as South Africa has gone on some of these issues? Um, I would argue, and I think that the point that you make solves part of the problem, which is that all, a lot of countries, if not, you know, yeah, certainly in our region, already have some form of public interest um, consideration uh, in their legislation, right? And so it's not a question of whether we should have it. The question is uh, whether it should be broader and whether we're achieving the desired impact. And I want to say a couple of things here. I think maybe just to reflect first on the earlier discussion. Um, uh, what the authority, I think, is, is, is to be commended for in South Africa is that there are also um, now guidelines that, that help with the interpretation and provide certainty around this issue, this kind of amorphous issue of public interest. And I think that's quite important. So the principles are embodied in the Act. The Commission is not wavering on its commitment to, to, to driving some of these objectives through its powers in the Competition Act. But it's also taken the care to make sure that there is market and business certainty 
um, and broader certainty around how we will treat these issues, which issues will we, will we deal with and which issues won't be dealt with under the Competition Act. And I think that's, that's an important starting point. So it's not some kind of wild west uh, uh, enforcement and, uh, of, of, of public, various public interest um, goals through mergers and through different transactions. It's still governed by a kind of set of publicly available principles. And I think that's, that's, that's an important thing to remember. Um, there's also the usual principles around the fact that, well, first of all, there is going to be an assessment of the SLC if you're talking about mergers. Um, the, the kind of usual competition considerations still apply. And I think that provides, that's an important thing to remember as well. We don't do away with the considerations of efficiency, uh, et cetera, just because we're also interested in the impact of a transaction on employment or on um, a sector uh, small businesses, for instance, in a particular sector or historically disadvantaged individuals. These things uh, work together, I would argue. Um, there are still the obvious principles around merger specificity, um, et cetera, uh, that are clearly defined there, right? And so I think that should give broad comfort that there's, um, that we're not in the wild west here. Uh, I think on this question of impact, um, uh, you, you ask a very good question about whether, well, should we bother doing this through competition law? Um, to the extent that competition law only focuses on the individual cases and instances, and so could never hope to achieve the kind of wider societal impact from its public interest interventions that, that are perhaps hoped that it would, be, would achieve. But I do think the contrary to that is that it's perhaps a good thing that the competition law does focus on specific instances at a time in dealing with these considerations, because it means that an objective and fair assessment of the facts of a particular case or industry are taken into account. It's not a broad brush approach. Um, and in some instances, the authority has actually turned away concerns about public interest issues in particular transactions because of an objective assessment that says, um, we see the issue, but there isn't the evidence to support that this is relevant to this merger. And I think that's, that's a very important way um, uh, or manner in which this issue has been dealt with in practice, right? Um, uh, more broadly, I think what, what, this, what the prominence and I think even global attention to the South African approach to public interest issues has brought um, is a general and in principle vigilance about uh, uh, the importance of considering the wider implications of, of competition law decisions, right? So even at the principle level, I think it's absolutely critical. Um, the fact that there is consideration on the part of companies, their representatives, the authorities at different courts, about the impacts on jobs uh, in a country that has got probably one of the highest unemployment rates in the world um, is an important thing, right? Um, and I want to make uh, finish off perhaps with, with, with an example here, just to illustrate how I think uh, pu public interest considerations are, in, are an important bridge that links competition law as we know it from the kind of early debates in the 70s and 80s, right? About concentration, et cetera, that links it to the realities of societies. Um, there was recently a large merger in, in an industry uh, where that is uh, kind of broadly co um, considered to be concentrated, where uh, part of the consideration that the authorities had to, had to take into account was this issue of substantial job losses that would result from the transaction. Um, I think uh, an important uh, hint at the role that authorities play, even on these public interest issues, is that without the interrogation by the authorities of the claimed necessary job losses that would have to result as a result of that merger transaction, um, it wouldn't have been revealed through the competition, other than the competition process, that actually the companies could not justify the full extent of the claimed job losses. It turns out that aspects of the calculations were, were um, in crude terms, uh, uh, thumb sucks, right? Uh, and so you would have had something close to a thousand households affected by a callous decision by companies to, to shed jobs, whereas actually upon closer, closer inspection through the public interest considerations, there was a middle ground that was reached that protected at least some employment, but also allowed the firm to pursue the transaction. And so uh, I don't answer your question in terms of whether we're making an aggregate impact, but I think that example illustrates that uh, in, especially in a developing country context, even those small impacts can have huge knock-on effects in our economy. Uh, I think I'll park it there for now and maybe respond to other comments as well. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for this. And thank you very much for this part of the discussion because um, with growing concerns about uh, sustainability, as has been mentioned before, 
um, there are issues, uh, I mean, there are questions being raised in uh, certainly in Europe and uh, I don't know uh, where else, um, but uh, certainly in Europe about how should competition authorities integrate this dimension? So should it be made a public interest goal? Should it be in the way in which they interpret the law? Uh, should it be technically as an efficiency? And if so, as uh, Mrs. Vestager said, uh, uh, should we change a little bit our concept of uh, what are the acceptable efficiencies that could be uh, uh, weighed against uh, uh, restriction of competition? So I think it is an important discussion and that Christian Wilson wants to uh, talk about it. Thank you, Fred. So, so a number of, of our interventions this morning have described how competition policy best serves consumers and domestic economies when it focuses exclusively on consumer welfare. Damien's point uh, is, is well taken that if you have multiple goals within competition law, you create the potential for capture and you detract from predictability. Um, it, in the US, if I can offer just a couple of examples from our experience, I think public interest goals are best addressed by agencies that are set up specifically to address particular concerns like the Small Business Administration, whose mission is to establish, uh, the, to ensure the vitality of, of small business. Um, my concern with a public interest mandate, unless given some defined meaning, is that it can result in uncertainty for firms and for consumers. And one, one very recent example, I believe, from the US is instructive. The Federal Communications Commission in the United States has a public interest mandate uh, and, and Congress left to the FCC uh, the interpretation of what this standard means. Unfortunately, the vagueness of this mandate has led to wild swings in regulatory policy. Sometimes the agency's leadership thinks more regulation will protect and benefit the public, but sometimes the FCC believes public benefits most from market efficiency. And we see this in our recent debate over net neutrality. Under the Obama administration, the FCC issued the open internet order, uh, which reflected the view public interest is best served by regulations that control how fixed line broadband providers handle internet traffic. It preferred the interest of edge providers like Google and Netflix. But under the Trump administration, the FCC reversed this policy saying the order created unnecessary regulations that hold back investment and innovation. So in other words, in just three years, the broadband sector went from relatively little market regulation to a significant regulatory scheme and then uh, back to a deregulatory regime. And in fact, the changed incentives from these two different policies are visible in the level of investment. Broadband network investment dropped more than 5.6% under the open internet order, which was the first time investment fell during a period of economic growth. But that investment rebounded once the order was reversed. And so I, I understand the desire on the part of many governments and legislatures, in, including those in the United States, to promote sectors of their own economies through government measures. In addition to distorting competition and hurting consumer welfare in the short run, though, these, these policies often end up being counterproductive. Take, for example, what happened in the U.S. automotive and, and steel industries. And so I think, um, you know, if, if governments do take steps to promote industry through a public interest standard, it should be done in a competitively neutral way. And, uh, and in a way, as Tondo has described, that is very transparent and clear. And obviously, the OECD has done important work on promoting competitive neutrality. And competition agencies can also play a role in, in this regard by being an advocate for a level playing field and against industrial policies that distort competition and risk provoking trade retaliation, which ultimately harms consumers and uh, which backfires on the domestic economy. Thank you, Christine, uh, for that. I'm not surprised that uh, you have uh, this view. I think that there is uh, uh, one of the uh, di difficulties or the differences uh, is between countries like uh, Europe or you know, in Europe or in France or in the US, where there is enough support for competition as a value to society, and uh, for saying this, 
uh, and therefore for accepting to have competition law, antitrust laws, um, and other countries where it's not so evident to people that competition is a good thing, and where the only way to actually promote competition is in fact to have some public interest goal in, in, in the law. And uh, so I take that what you said at the end is if you have to have, uh, I mean, first of all, you're not in favor of public interest goal where you can avoid them. But if you cannot avoid them, then be very transparent about how you're going to uh, enforce them uh, in order to limit the uncertainty, uh, which can be very detrimental to, uh, to firms. Um, okay. We have talked, thank you very much for this. We have talked already quite a bit about uh, the question of legitimacy of what is a, a competition law and antitrust law. And I wanted to turn to Christine to ask her um, to comment on two quotes coming from very different people, very different backgrounds, which are basically saying that maybe the economic interpretation of competition, which is the one that we tend to stick to, is not so legitimate. Now, one part of the uh, one quotation is from the US House of Representative uh, staff report. Uh, and it says that the antitrust laws that Congress enacted in the 1890 and 1914, uh, the Sherman Act and the Clayton Act and the Federal Trade Commission Act reflected a recognition that unchecked monopoly power poses a threat to our economy as well as to our democracy. And that Congress, the US Congress, reasserted this vision through subsequent antitrust laws, including the robinson patman Act, the Senator Kefauver Act, uh, and the hartz codd Scott Rodino Act uh, by adopting a narrow construction of consumer welfare as the sole goal of antitrust laws, the Supreme Court has limited the analysis of competitive harm to focus primarily on price and output rather than the competitive process and has thus contravened the legislative history and the legislative intent. Uh, now in Europe, we've had the same kind of debate about what is the legitimacy of competition law and I, I'm going to quote a statement by Advocate General Cockett in the post-Denmark case, uh, which is the following one. I mean, so she comes from a very different angle. I mean, she doesn't have a political agenda, as one can uh, believe the uh, authors of the report uh, of the House of Representatives had. Uh, she says these questions and the questions about uh, uh, um, uh, discounts uh, are particularly important at a time when there are mounting calls for European competition law to adopt a more economic approach. It is my view, says Advocate General Cockart, that in its replies, the signal effect of which is likely to extend well beyond the present case, the court should not allow itself to be influenced so much by current thinking, zeitgeist, or ephemeral trends, but should have regard rather to the legal foundation on which the prohibition of abuse of a dominant position rests in EU law. And of course, the implication is that uh, uh, in the EU law, the fathers of the treaty never had in mind uh, uh, consumer surplus as a goal of competition law. But the only goal of competition law in the treaty is to facilitate the development of the internal market. Uh, so it's not to protect consumers, it's to eliminate barriers between countries. So in both cases, the question is raised, Our economists came in, gave an interpretation of what competition law should be about, were they legitimate in doing this or should we, and, and we know that I don't think that Senator Sherman really had consumer surplus directly in mind when he pushed the uh, Sherman Act. Uh, it's the same thing with the founders of the EU treaty. So is the economic interpretation of competition law illegitimate? Christine? Thank you, Fred, for the, for the opportunity to, to talk about what I view as a very important topic. So uh, I think it'll be helpful to begin with some context. You mentioned uh, Senator Sherman and what he intended. Uh, so the, the Antitrust Act that bears his name prohibits every contract combination or conspiracy and restraint of trade. And he explained in 1890 why the law was written so broadly. He said, quote, I admit it is difficult to define in legal language the precise line between lawful and unlawful 
combinations, this must be left for the courts to determine in every particular case. And, and the courts then spent several decades trying to come up with a workable standard to help them determine what conduct should be illegal under the federal antitrust laws. Of course, they couldn't apply the literal language of the Sherman Act because banning every contract that restrains trade would lead to banning most contracts. So based on the common law that predated the Sherman Act, the courts in the United States said this new statute must be intended to ban only unreasonable restraints of trade. The, the courts worked out that certain kinds of restraints were always unreasonable and anti-competitive, and so those were held to be per se illegal. In other words, even if one could imagine some benefit from this conduct, judicial efficiency weighed in favor of labeling it unlawful without examining those purported benefits. But everything else had to be judged under what we call the rule of reason, which assesses both the benefits and the harms of the conduct at issue. And economic research began to play a more important role in helping evaluate under the rule of reason uh, what, what kinds of conduct should be perceived as lawful. So first, economic research found benign explanations for highly concentrated markets, which broke from prior work that was suspicious of concentration. And this research raised important arguments undercutting what we call the structure conduct performance paradigm that had guided antitrust policy and many judicial decisions. In one of our important cases in the United States, Continental TV v. GTE Sylvania, the Supreme Court in, 1990, in 1977 relied on economic reasoning to hold non-price vertical restraints, including territorial restraints on franchisees at issue in that case, should be evaluated under the rule of reason. And the court declared the rule of reason standard must be based on a demonstrable economic effect. So after decades spent trying to balance a mix of economic, social, and political goals for antitrust, the U.S. Supreme Court in 1979 described the Sherman Act as a consumer welfare prescription. And going back to 1979, of course, uh, and this is the way we've approached antitrust law in the United States uh, for since then, um, I, I am not sure that it would be fair to say that using economic analysis, at least in the United States, uh, to, to guide antitrust enforcement is zeitgeist. This is something that, uh, that we have been doing for many decades now. But in 1979, the Supreme Court described the Sherman Act as a consumer welfare prescription. And of course, as we all know, this standard seeks to maximize consumer surplus or in economic terms, the difference between what each consumer actually pays and what he or she would be willing to pay. So at bottom, we move from bright line rules to effects based analysis because the latter looks at what we care about, whether competition is actually harmed and it's more likely to give us the right answer. But I think someone else on the panel has said this morning and I'd like to emphasize economic analysis is not an end in itself. It is a tool that we use to determine which approach will maximize consumer welfare. Economics teaches if you force companies to share certain assets with competitors, innovation and investment in those assets will decline. Some proposals, in other words, may sound fairer in how they would divide the pie, but they actually result in a smaller pie for policymakers to divide. So as indicated by both the, the post Denmark case and the EU's adoption of the as efficient competitor test, the move toward effects based analysis is by no means unique to the United States. Multiple jurisdictions around the world began with inflexible rule oriented competition enforcement, but then evolved toward a, a, a less form based approach. And Fred, as you know, much of this international harmonization took place because of the hard work that we've done in multilateral organizations like the Competition Committee of the OECD and the ICN. But even as the world has evolved toward competition enforcement based on an economic analysis of effects, the bipartisan consensus on antitrust in the United States uh, as, as exemplified by the report from which you quoted, may now be fraying. I think the, the report that was issued in October by the staff of the House Antitrust Subcommittee provides a helpful roundup of many suggestions that are being made in the current debate. But let me emphasize at the outset that the House Antitrust Subcommittee doesn't uh, 
in and of itself indicate that antitrust law in the United States is changing. It is a staff report that is made by one uh, committee of one house, and we have bicameral uh, legislature here in the United States. And so we need to, uh, to put those remarks in context. But to go specifically to what the report says, some of the report's proposals would replace sophisticated economic analysis with bright line rules. In other words, embracing the outdated structure conduct performance paradigm. And it would replace the consumer welfare standard with a public interest standard. And as Damian noted, that would require enforcers to engage in an almost unavoidably political calculus of whose interests to serve. If we inject additional goals into the antitrust analysis, we greatly increase subjectivity and uncertainty. The consumer welfare standard, precisely because it is tethered to economic principles, provides predictability to market actors, administrability to courts, and credibility to the decisions made by competition enforcers. And the consumer welfare test is a straightforward one. If consumers are harmed by reduced output, decreased product quality or innovation or higher prices resulting from the exercise of market power, this result trumps uh, offsetting gains to producers or others. And so the consumer welfare test is easy to administer on a case by case basis. Uh, for the reasons that we've noted, if we have a standard that adds even uh, a single additional goal, then we, we, bring, um, we bring, I think, a, uh, some blurring of, uh, of application of the different tests and, uh, and less predictability and administratability. Now, I, I do agree with some of the House Antitrust Subcommittee reports recommendations. I do believe it will be more helpful for the FTC to publish more written explanations for its decisions, both to take and to abstain from taking action. Retrospectives should be used more frequently. And the FTC is now aiming to, to do this in a very formal way with its new merger retrospective initiative. And Dave Schmidt will present on this in more detail on Wednesday. And I agree that the budgets of the FTC and DOJ should be increased to keep up with the size of the economy that we are policing. And, uh, and Professor Kovacic uh, has, has very helpfully told Congress that the agency should, uh, should receive a, a much larger um, budget, which, which would be very helpful if that actually materializes. Uh, and, and and we are now litigating a record number of matters and any lawsuit against a large company pits the government against much heftier resources than we can command. And so, uh, so a much larger budget would be appreciated. But, but the bottom line is I think that economic analysis is what gives us predictability, administratability, and credibility. And moving away from those things, I think, goes back to the very concern that was raised in Mrs. Vestiger's Q&A session, um, how do we speak about the importance of competition law with credibility and, uh, and achieve buy-in from our citizens? And, uh, and predictability, certainty, and credibility are all very important to achieving that outcome. And that is what economic analysis allows us to do. Okay, thank you for that. I, uh, I find it interesting uh, what uh, you said, of course, uh, and I do understand this argument. Um, I still have a question, which is, uh, if we really wanted to follow an economic analysis, wouldn't we have a total welfare surplus uh, standard, which we don't have? So in a sense, it's not even what economic analysis suggests. Second, in terms of uh, credibility, I thought it was interesting to hear Mrs. Vestager earlier on when she said that competition was part of economic democracy. So she has an entirely different concept. Uh, for example, I mean, if you believe that it's part of uh, democracy, you don't want to suppress a small and weak firm because it, uh, like a small and weak citizen, it has a right to exist. Okay, so, so we, we get a completely different perspective on this. So it seems to me that the political credibility may be something different from what you were talking about. You were talking about scientific credibility, maybe more than political uh, credibility, at least in some uh, countries. Um, 
Uh, is Does anybody want to mention anything? Because I don't see that there is a, a flag up. Uh, yeah. uh, Fred, on, can on I just issue? say a word about the, the total sure. welfare standard? Sure. Um, sure. So I am not advocating that standard today, but I have spoken about this and written about the total welfare standard. And I think that there are certain characteristics of that standard that actually are quite, um, quite favorable. I think uh, in, 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 in short, it could enhance sustainability by ensuring that all resources go to their highest valued use. And that enables consumers to maintain their standard of living, but reduce their consumption of resources. I think it would, uh, a total welfare standard would maximize the size of the entire pie in contrast with the consumer welfare standard that maximizes consumer surplus. And some commentators like uh, Professor Farrell and Michael Katz have suggested competition enforcers are best suited to maximizing total surplus and then legislators and other agencies can decide how to distribute it. And of course, the total welfare standard tethered to economics also would score well on the goals of administrability, predictability, and credibility. But I think it's important to recognize you get into, um, you get into certain uh, very thorny questions about how total welfare would be applied in the international arena. Uh, so, for example, if you have a merger of two foreign-owned firms, harm would fall on domestic consumers and cost savings would happen outside one's own country. Uh, and so I think you know, there, are, there are downsides, but there are also some very favorable aspects to the total welfare standard. Okay. Thank you. Tando? Yeah, just a, just a couple of comments on this. I, I think it's, and, and while I fully agree with with. Uh, the, the importance of, of, um, of regimes being able to offer their societies kind of certainty, uh, predictability, etc. I think that, I certainly don't think that that's why these, these, um, these policy frameworks, competition law, competition policy exist. I think that that's kind of the implementation of it, which speaks to um, uh, the fact that uh, once the society has kind of espoused values that are embodied in its competition legislation, if you read the South African Act, it's got two or three initial pages and all these values that it seeks to achieve. Then you break those down, these wider kind of societal goals into uh, bite-sized, manageable, predictable, implementable legal provisions. You don't start and say, well, let's create um, some certainty through nice, well-worded kind of legal provisions. And then we'll work backwards later when we have to deal with some of the concerns that arise uh, retrospectively. Um, and I say this issue about concerns that arise ret retrospectively. I think part of the issue, if you read Massimo Motta and others on, on too soft on mergers in, 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 in Europe or his argument there, but also the, the kind of global uh, and particularly OECD um, competition authority reckoning around the fact that perhaps too many of these kind of large tech mergers uh, were, were allowed through. I would argue part of how we allowed them all through and now why we're trying to unscramble the egg is because we let the economic evidence be the only determining factor. And now the new um, uh, um, arguments are emerging around, um, for instance, from the Furman report around the importance of pro-competitive ex-ante regulation, right? Which is, it's, you know, it's, 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 it's it's, it's blasphemy speak, but it's very important speak because it's recognizing that if we follow the approach we've always followed, particularly approaches linked to the SCP, which has been widely discredited, then we will end up with issues and market designs and structures that we'll find very hard to reverse. And I think that's an important um, consideration. So uh, without being too, too, too going too far on this point, I think lastly, I'll say that what we've learned certainly from the, the South African jurisdiction, I think this could be debated, but arguably, um, there is a case to say the South African authority has also shown the ability of authorities to adapt and amend and look back and review and correct where there have been issues of a lack of certainty, where there have been issues of a lack of implement uh, implementability. And that I think is the type of, of regulatory or regulators that you want in a society. Uh, we set out some goals in 1998 when the act came into force, 1999, um, some of them uh, we landed, some of them we didn't. We looked back, we reviewed what we'd done, um, and, and, and we're now going into new uncomfortable spaces as well. We're introducing participation into our act. But I think that's because the act has to be responsive to the society in which it exists. It's not to serve 
um, it's not to serve a business certainty or to market alone. I think it responds to wider societal issues as well, uh, in my personal view, at least. Bill? Uh, uh, on, on, on Tendo's point, I, I just say that the big debate going ahead uh, is between, say, the Furman authors, the Stigler Center authors, they're insisting on an economics-based framework. Uh, and their main opponents in this debate are people from who've been at the committee before, Open Markets, Barry Lynn, Lena Khan, who say that the, the fundamental question that has to be answered is, are you with a broader notion of citizen welfare that encompasses not just the interests of individuals as buyers of goods and services, but as workers, as residents in communities that are subject to distant control by large companies, uh, as owners of small businesses? Are you willing to accept that broader conception of competition policy or not? That's the debate. And the, the, the main enthusiasts for the ex-ante regulatory frameworks are all talking about economics. Uh, and indeed, they get very nervous when you try to bring in this larger complement of concerns and if you were to put them all in a cage, you'd have a real fist fight uh, between the people who say do much more within an economics-based framework and those who say that's a certifying mark of what's wrong with you is you cannot envision the larger interest of competition policy as incorporating this broader set of interests. That I think is the big debate that we're gonna have coming ahead in the next few years. So it is still an open question. And uh, uh, okay, so that, that was a very interesting exchange. And I think that it's, it's very clear uh, uh, on the part of Christine, how she thinks that the predictability and legitimacy are really important things and how the US slowly but surely gave, uh, I mean, the Supreme Court uh, gave a precision to something which was not very precise originally. Uh, by uh, thinking about how it could best uh, uh, be uh, uh, implemented. Uh, on the other side, we have the adaptative kind of approach of Tendo, uh, uh, which uh, says, well, legitimacy and predictability may be important, but they may be not the paramount uh, uh, issues of a competition law. And then we have the debate that uh, uh, Bill is talking about. So, I mean, we still have a little bit of of debate on this, even though there is in the competition community uh, quite a bit of support for uh, uh, the economic approach. But as we saw, I mean, certainly in Europe, judges are not taken by this uh, consensus. Uh, and the uh, ECJ has never, in fact, accepted the uh, consumer surplus uh, standard as being a, a valid uh, standard for European comp for the interpretation of European competition law. So this leads me to uh, the next question, which is the next to the last question. If we accept that we uh, that the economic uh, uh, pattern is uh, uh, to uh, be particularly important in competition law, is the consumer welfare standard itself too rigidly enforced? And uh, I. Uh, there, I want to ask uh, the following question, and I will ask to uh, Diana. Uh, what says in the, in the consumer welfare standard, is there anything that says that we should have a short time perspective on competition? If I take the example of, uh, uh, the example of uh, uh, sustainability, for example, and if we have hypothetically an agreement between uh, automobile firms uh, to go beyond the standard that exists uh, in terms of emission and therefore to have cleaner car than what they are forced to do, isn't it that we can look using the consumer standard, uh, we can look at this from two different perspectives. One of them is to say, well, that's going to increase the price of cars. Uh, so the consumers are going to be hurt. The other one is to say, well, that is going to uh, uh, limit pollution uh, or uh, lead to a cleaner air, and that's going to lower the cost of transportation for the people of the community. In other words, whether we take a short-term view or longer-term view, applying the consumer 
uh, welfare standard, we can come to different conclusions. So why is it that we are so focused on a very narrow, immediate interpretation of consumer welfare? Diana. Thank you very much. And I, I appreciate being asked to respond to this question. Um, I, I can take the opportunity to pull together some threads of the, the statements and, and arguments that we've um, already heard. So I, I think the answer to your question is, um, is, a, is, a, is a complicated one. And, and it's something I think that uh, different jurisdictions are working through. We are certainly working through it in the United States. But, but I, th I, I think more importantly, we have to think about uh, the scope of the consumer welfare standard, what it can do, what it can't do, what it should do, um, is all part of the broader debate over um, the tools in what I call the competition policy toolkit. And um, as antitrust enforcers and advocates, we, we are very passionate about what we do, but I think we often lose sight of the fact that antitrust law or competition law is, a, is one tool in a broader toolkit. Uh, that really does include a variety of levers uh, that we can use to address larger public policy pro uh, problems. Uh, other tools obviously are economic regulation, social regulation, there's labor policy, there's trade policy, intellectual property policy, sustainability. These are all tools that ideally would work together in a complementary way uh, to, to support and to bootstrap uh, antitrust enforcement. And unfortunately, um, I mean, that's a very tough, tough uh, order to fill. Uh, we struggle with that in the US and I think other jurisdictions do as well, which is why I think the OECD's work is so valuable in that we do have examples like in South Africa where there is a, a public interest-based standard, but we have other examples say in the United States where it is strongly rooted in a consumer welfare standard. So we have these natural experiments to look at and, and to learn from. So, so I think to answer part of the question, we have to realize that, um, that antitrust enforcement, competition enforcement is law enforcement. It is, a, it is an evidence-based process. It is investigatory. Um, it is subject to judicial review. So the, the concepts of, of standards and administra administrability, uh, as we've heard before, uh, do play in in a very, very important way. So as law enforcement, uh, we have to think about how antitrust can work together with other, other policy tools uh, to, to, promote, uh, to promote the broader public policy goals. So I think the question is, wh wh where have we gone wrong in the US with the consumer welfare standard? I think that's a fair question to ask. Uh, what technically can it do? Uh, and, 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 and what has it done? So I, I think the consumer welfare standard is actually more, far more competent in addressing issues than it has been given credit for. So it rightly focuses, for example, on the impacts of anti-competitive mergers or anti-competitive conduct on market participants that are adversely affected by the exercise of market power. I think that is the broadest construction of the consumer welfare standard. It focuses on those participants that are adversely affected, either by market power exercised on the buyer side of the market, monopsony, or on the seller side of the market, monopoly. So that gives the standard the ability to address harms at any level in a supply chain, which really goes to uh, the competitive process as we work our way through different markets and uh, types of conduct. So that allows, allows the application of the standard in input markets, for example, that includes labor, but also in intermediate markets where small businesses, for example, are consumers of, of, of intermediate products all the way down to the end, the end consumer. So it's very flexible in that, in that sense. And it, the, the standard addresses a lot of things, both static uh, short-term and dynamic longer-term effects. It looks at prices, for example, short-term prices. It can look at non-price dimensions of competition, such as quality. Um, on the efficiency side, it, it can look at static short-term cost effects, cost reductions, for example, from mergers. It can look at uh, uh, effects such as new products, new products faster to market. So it, 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 the short-term and the longer-term dynamic effects are, are, I think, far more reaching than, than the standard has been applied uh, thus far. Interestingly, the Consumer Welfare Standard also addresses transfers 
uh, which goes directly to distributions of wealth from, from consumers over to producers. It, it also inherently addresses the ability of consumers to discipline the exercise of market power. So that goes to the concept of defending the market or defense of the market. Uh, so the, the consumer welfare standard can do all, they think, all of these things. So, so where, has, where have things gone wrong? Well, the things have gone wrong because uh, defendants in antitrust cases have been very persuasive in arguing that mergers, for example, um, which might produce short-term adverse price effects can still be uh, acceptable because they produce longer term uh, uh, consumer benefits uh, as well as short term uh, uh, cost savings. So there is an asymmetry between the application of the standard on the, con on the competitive effects side and the application of the standard on the, on the efficiency side. And that asymmetry has really, I think, been at the root of, of, of lax merger enforcement in particular. It's very easy to let mergers through when you can show that short-term price effects will be overwhelmed easily by cost reductions and longer term, harder to prove consumer benefits. Those are very, very difficult to prove. So expanding the standard to include uh, you know, other, other effects, I think, um, poses some really fundamental questions, not only about administrability, but about converting what is essentially partial equilibrium analysis and economics to a more general equi equilibrium analysis to include effects on other markets, for example. Um, I think there is a danger of replicating the public interest standards in the, in the sector regulators. Uh, I'm a former sector regulator and we struggled with our public interest standard at the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. So the question is finishing up very quickly, what can we do? How can we do to better implement the standard uh, uh, to, to, to maximize its full potential? Well, one is I think the courts are going to have to grapple with this fundamental asymmetry of accepting only static uh, uh, arguments or, or static effects on the competitive effects side, but allowing expansive, expansive efficiencies claims through uh, that make it very difficult to, um, uh, to, to block or to challenge mergers. So there has to be some alignment of, of uh, symmetry on the competitive effects side and the, um, on the efficiency side. I, I also think that given the importance of the, the balancing of the efficiencies, we're going to have to do more than just show case specific, verifiable or cognizable efficiencies. I think given all of what we know now about harmful, harmful murders, we're going to have to start actually seeing those efficiencies verified through merger retrospectives, for example. And we have to show, see proof that they were passed on uh, passed on to consumers. And I, finally, I, I think we need to make much better efforts about including um, uh, doing a better job in antitrust analysis uh, in market definition, for example, and competitive effects analysis and entry analysis uh, to, to factor in these external policy constraints. For example, uh, 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 environmental regulation, uh, what is going to be uh, upcoming privacy regulation, all of those pose constraints that antitrust analysis must, uh, must account for. And I think we're going to be seeing this uh, um, most prominently when we, we see around the world the development of these digital markets regulatory acts and digital markets regulators, where we will absolutely see the tension between uh, a, a consumer welfare standard on the competition side coming up against a more public interest standard on the regulatory side. And that I think is where some effort needs to be, some thought needs to be given to prevent conflicts and tensions that are, are, are probably going to emerge. Thank you very much. I mean, I take from what you said, uh, two things. One of them is the fact that uh, you acknowledge the fact that uh, the consumer welfare standard is flexible. It can be interpreted in different ways. And then you made the point that in the US at least, uh, you think that there is an asymmetry in the, uh, in the enforcement of or the, the implementation of the principle uh, in the sense that uh, uh, efficiencies have been allowed uh, uh, too easily, uh, so to speak. Uh, and uh, therefore this has led to a weak merger control. What's interesting for me as a European is that we've got exactly the opposite debate. 
uh, the opposite debate is that the commission never accept any efficiency uh, defense because it always says, uh, well, it's not immediate. I cannot see it today. So it does not exist and therefore is biased the other way. So the question is really whether there's some work should go into trying to get to a consensus on what is the right time frame, because as you suggested, the limit between what is another policy and what is included in the analysis very much depends on the time frame that uh, we adopt. And uh, not only should it be, uh, I mean, there are good examples uh, 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 of this in Europe, but I, we don't have time to go into this. But I think that uh, maybe a little bit of work on uh, how should we master this flexibility? And what would be a reasonable and acceptable interpretation uh, would be quite useful. Now, time is short, so I'm going to go to the very last uh, issue, which is whether you think that we're up to the digital challenge, whether you think that competition authorities are up. And if you don't think that they're quite up, or even if you think that they're up, but they could be even better prepared, what do you think is the most important thing that they should look for to try to be prepared for the digital, uh, for the issues in the in the digital sectors, um, I did want to preface this by saying that last week at the OECD uh, during the competition committee, we had a roundtable on uh, competition among ecosystems, and one of the things that came out clearly of this was that the competition among ecosystems doesn't present itself exactly the way competition among firms. Uh, present itself and that some of the concept that we use like market definition and may be less relevant or may need to be adjusted uh, for this. But let me go to uh, each and every one of you to, ha to have your feeling on where we are. And I will start with Christine. Thank you, Fred. So uh, I believe the antitrust laws in the United States at least are sufficiently broad and flexible to take into account the dynamics of the digital sector as it exists today and as it will evolve in the future. This is a question that we have grappled with numerous times over the last two or three decades in the United States, first with the Microsoft case regarding network effects and tipping markets. And this issue was also addressed by the Antitrust Modernization Commission, which was commissioned by Congress. Both times, experts found antitrust law enforcement to be capable of addressing the digital sector. Now, the traditional tools of antitrust law itself are not the same as our knowledge of the particular sectors and business practices to which we apply the tools. And so to increase our expertise and to refine the tools that we have, the FTC has spent uh, a great deal of time focusing on these issues. We held hearings on competition and consumer protection in this century, uh, had a number of different panels on a variety of issues in the tech sector. And we also formed what is now the Technology Enforcement Division. We're conducting market studies uh, and, uh, and we're looking at potential acquisitions and, and, and acquisitions by, uh, by GAFAM that were not previously notified to us to determine whether we need to change notification standards. But in all of these ways, we are grappling with the, uh, the, the developments and the dynamism of this area and attempting to refine our tools. Now we've, we've talked about how to the extent antitrust is tethered to economic analysis um, that provides predictability and certainty. It also allows us to take account of evolving economics. DOJ and a number of state AGs, as everyone knows, have announced the case against Google and news reports uh, as late as this morning from the Washington Post indicate that the FTC in some states are reportedly considering an antitrust case against Facebook. Now, it seems premature to conclude that the antitrust laws are not suited to the task of preserving competition in this high-tech space because the antitrust agencies, of course, haven't brought or haven't received rulings yet on the cases that uh, people believe will be the bellwethers of antitrust's ability to police big tech. Now, we have brought monopolization cases against tech companies that involve network effects. For example, just last year, the FTC sued a health information company called SureScript for allegedly using both illegal vertical and horizontal restraints to maintain its monopolies over multi-sided electronic prescribing 
markets. <clears throat> and so I think, you know, we, we see data points indicating that our antitrust laws are sufficient for the purposes for which they were created. And the application of those laws will continue to be informed by our increasing knowledge in the area of economics and through our continued uh, interactions with various stakeholders that allow us to remain abreast of, of developments in this space. And so to close, you know, I, I remain confident that competition is the best way to produce the best outcomes for consumers. And I believe that antitrust law informed by continually refined economic analysis is the best way to achieve the, the most good for the greatest number. Thank you very much. Uh, I think lots of people could agree with you. Uh, th there is one uh, dimension in some countries. The idea is that we can't wait until the economic analysis comes up because uh, uh, we are going to have situations that are going to be uh, uh, impossible to, cor to correct and that therefore uh, there should be more tools uh, that would allow to intervene even without having the benefit of uh, 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 the uh, all the thinking of the economic thinking uh, that you are talking about. This is a little bit the way, for example, Europe is going as opposed to the US where uh, you were saying that uh, uh, being informed by uh, economics is very important. Um, Damien? Um, yeah, I guess let, let me sort of focus on um, uh, the question of whether we need to have new tools, um, in particular in the European context. Now, in, in the last couple of years, there have been a number of important reports in the, uh, in the EU that have highlighted the issues. I mean, in particular, as mentioned before, the Furman report and then the, the Kramer Schweitzer report in, uh, in the EU. Um, there was no discussion about two initiatives. There was a discussion about the new competition instrument and a discussion about regulation. And uh, I'll be very short given the time constraint, um, but I am a bit concerned about the, the current proposal for regulation in the context of the uh, what is currently being put forward. Because this regulation envisages a, a process uh, in which there would be essentially a nomination of which firm should be regulated. So there would be an analysis by a regulator of whether particular firms should be subject to regulations and others and others not. Uh, and there would be an assessment on the basis of a number of criteria, entry barriers, I mean, the role of the firm in the ecosystem and so forth. And then having designated the firms that should be regulated, the current proposal would impose on those firms a list of prohibited conduct and would also impose on those firms a set of obligations to guarantee market contestability. And if you look at the list of the prohibited con conduct for those firms that would be designated by this regulator, I mean, it's actually, you know, they, they involve uh, conduct having to do with the incentive to, or the ability to, to multi-home, uh, with respect to uh, self-preferencing, uh, with respect to data uh, portability and some uh, contractual provisions, and with respect to the, the obligations that would be essentially obligations on uh, data sharing, access to key inputs, interoperability. And I'm concerned about this because I'm not sure that we have the, the type of understanding of these markets that is required in order to make these you know, very important choices. You know, these choices involve very strong presumptions about what sort of large platforms can do and other platforms uh, cannot do. And you know, how do we inform these presumptions? I mean, you inform presumptions from stable economic theory, from enforcement experience and empirical evidence. And I'm not convinced that we have completely stable economic theory with respect to uh, competition among platforms. Uh, I'm sure that we don't have a lot of empirical evidence about how platforms compete. And this may sort of echo what you were referring to with respect to the discussion uh, last week. And we don't have a lot of enforcement experience. I mean, the, the, the decisions that we have in the EU so far are, are possibly not sort of, um, you know, accumulating 
sufficient sort of enforcement experience. I don't want to be critical of those decisions, but uh, so basically saying that you know these these decisions are subject to are subject to debate, and and so there is a risk with the sort of regulatory instrument that the EU is currently considering of basically only allowing innovation by small firms and basically preventing large firms from innovating. And, and, and I'm not sure that we have the knowledge in order to strike that balance. Thank you very much. So, um, so you, you thought that some of the decisions were misguided. That was the word that you didn't, didn't dare <laughs> say it, but I'm saying it for you. Um, uh, Professor Hohashi. Uh, thank you. Uh, because of data monopoly and consequential uh, network effect, digital platforms have a strong bargaining position against domestic business partners. Uh, Japan's IT Competitive Competition Act in principle can enforce against digital platforms by use of the abuse of superior bargaining position, but you know, such investigation often takes too long in view of the speed of innovations. So Japan, Japanese government recently introduced so-called the Transparency Act the, in the May of this year. Under this act, uh, the government adopts a co-regulation approach. Uh, first, you know, the government regulate digital platform. Uh, so this act is basically, you know, that the government regulates digital platform with the mutual understanding of other stakeholders, including a platform operator themselves. The cabinet office of the government first designate particular platforms, most likely larger digital platforms, and ask them to make a proposal or pledge as to how to improve transparency and fairness of their platforms. And this pledge is then evaluated by a review committee on the government side and may ask the digital platformer, data platform operator to revise their pledge with the government involvement. The accepted pledge will be uh, viewed by the public and the reputational damage will follow you know, if they don't follow the pledge. The draft audit will come out earlier next year and it remains to be seen you know, how it performs. But this scheme can be you know, thought of as a prelude to uh, ex-ante regulations as opposed to the antitrust enforcement as ex-post regulations. So this is the current status uh, of what we have and you know, kind of by view of uh, implementation of co-regulation approach in this area. Okay, innovative approach. Um, Bill? I think as we uh, heard from the commissioner this morning, uh, we don't have much time to think about this. Uh, the concrete is being poured right away, the roads being set, and we're gonna handle refinements later on. Uh, that is, uh, by the end of 2021, the United Kingdom and the European Union are gonna have new regulatory regimes in place, highly likely. Uh, it's going to be there. So uh, my initial instinct would be to say, to try to answer Damien's uh, very good question. Well, we, we ought to think about this more. I don't think there's going to be much more thinking about it. It's going to happen. It's going to happen quickly. Uh, the, the, the regulatory follow-up in the U.S. is going to be a lot slower, uh, but we have a lot of big cases running. Uh, Christine gave you a snapshot of a couple of them, uh, but there are significant matters in the courts right now that will continue and quite likely more to come. Uh, uh, so, so what can you do with this very fast developing infrastructure of policy making and enforcement? Uh, you could certainly have more of a debate right now about where you want to put the new regulatory framework. You've got a lot of experience about whether you want uh, a, a subject specific regulator. That is, if you call it the digital regulator, well, what's not digital? Is it going to absorb everything? Uh, do you want to give this to a competition policy authority right now using existing experience with groups like the Netherlands, uh, the countries like the Netherlands, Australia, that have had combined functions uh, that have a regulatory dimension? Um, uh, if, you, if you build something like this, do you, do you give it to an existing authority that's maybe because of its broader portfolio is less prone to being captured, more likely to achieve good policy integration, but where do you want to put it? That's an open debate still. Uh, that you can still have an influence on. Um, do you have the right people? Uh, if we were to ask right now across all the competition agencies, what is the total number of tech scientists employed in all of these agencies? Is that number 
less than or greater than 20 globally, less than or greater than 50 globally, 100. I don't know what the betting line at a good uh, bookmaking shop would look like, but uh, I bet it's not more than 100. I bet it's under 50. Uh, and if you just take the institutions that are making big policy bets on doing this work, how big's your team? How many people do you have who can really hold themselves out as knowing because of experience, because of technical training, this background? Uh, you know, I, I heard a poli high level policy official recently said, oh, lawyers are really smart. They're adaptable. They can pick up what they need. Um, a very flattering characterization of my profession uh, and lawyers, of course, uh, uh, occasionally write never in doubt, uh, uh, smartest people on earth. But if you, if you, if you were asking who is going to do this kind of work, uh, I'd, I'd love to see that the tech team there that's going to be advising and guiding on these presumptions are they the right ones. What does that team look like? Uh, my sense is in most agencies, it's really thin if it exists at all uh, with that kind of capability. So you could still add them to the conversation. That would seem to me to be very important. Um, next, uh, are all of these institutions that are doing all these things, are they talking to each other? What kind of integration is taking, across, uh, taking place across jurisdictions where the decisions made by the big economically significant jurisdictions will have global spillovers are they talking to each other about what they're going to do, about what these presumptions ought to look like? And, and it's not enough to meet in the GFC once a year and have a chat about this. Uh, this has to be a significant ongoing conversation right now. Uh, I say there's a lot less of it than there might be. And last, um, maybe it's too late to do the research now, but there is something that is the equivalent of competition agency big data. There's a lot of experience with trying to address a number of these issues. Agencies for a long time have been looking at innovation, quality, dynamism, patent licensing, rulemaking. There's a lot of experience, uh, but is it being brought to bear here? I think much less than one would think. Uh, I'll give you my last United Launch Alliance's story. There was a powerful efficiency claim made by the parties. You to the drop up the, sorry. We're going to increase reliability. They've had 150 straight consecutive launches. They hit the target. Interesting question. How did that happen? Thank you. Lots of questions. Not sure that we have um, satisfactory answers. Let me turn to Diana Moss. Thank you, and I'll, I'll be very short. So I think there are two major uh, groups of issues raised by uh, this coming uh, potential collision between antitrust and regulation and digital markets. One is, I, I think a lot of thinking needs to be given to the advent of the ecosystem business model because it really is a very unique uh, business model that uh, is different than how we typically think about horizontal integration or vertical integration or even conglomerate integration. And, and the ecosystem business model is important for antitrust because it really gives birth to uh, uh, concerns about uh, leveraging across a platform, uh, the use of data, consumer data, data to accomplish that leveraging, uh, data as an asset, data as a uh, data processing and artificial intelligence and, and analytics as an asset. So it is, it is fundamentally going to benefit. We will all fundamentally benefit by a multidisciplinary approach. Uh, we need to bring in the finance people, the strategic marketing, uh, strategic management people, the marketing folks. It, it can't just be lawyers and economists. It has to be a bigger community to fuel and to think constructively about this. I think it also may, will make us rethink presumptions, not only the horizontal presumption, but the need potentially for vertical merger presumptions and also acquisitions of potential competitors. And then finally, I do worry uh, uh, about this intersection between any digital markets regulation and antitrust. As we've seen in other sectors, other regulated sectors, uh, unless there is a savings clause for antitrust, there are going to be concerns about immunities uh, whether they would be um, uh, implied immunities, judicial immunities. And we do worry not only about the role of antitrust in enforcing competition, given the, the overlay of regulation in the sector or potential regulation in the sector, 
Um, but we also worry about remedy, for example, if sector regulators are in a position to take remedies, how will those uh, work with uh, or conflict with antitrust remedies? So I think that whole conversation about that intersection point is very important to have. Thank you very much. One other thing you said uh, is, uh, I mean, you pointed implicitly to the fact that there may be two sets of different issues, uh, uh, competition between ecosystems. We don't really understand, we need more work and we should be wary of uh, uh, what uh, we do. And competition within ecosystems, which may be a bit closer to what we're used to do. And we take a little bit fewer risks uh, in uh, uh, looking at some of those issues, of self-preferencing and things like this. Um, Thank you very much. Uh, my take on uh, what this very rich debate is that the uh, answer to the first question, does concentration show that we're ineffective? ineffective? The answer was don't jump too fast to conclusions. We need more research. The answer to the uh, second question on industrial policy was yes, competition authority do go out and reach out to the industrial policy people. There are things that you can tell them that will make uh, industrial policy more competition compliant and uh, or public procurement more competition compliant. Um, on the third question, uh, the uh, unevenness of the international competition, the message was don't reciprocate. Uh, try to restart trade negotiation on a better basis. Uh, uh, if you can uh, do it and possibly uh, include that dimension into econo the, the economic analysis that you conduct. On the fourth question, um, public interest goals. Um, I think we saw the difference between countries, uh, I mean, between points of views. Uh, they are very difficult to administer if you have to have them for legitimacy purpose, then transparency is uh, really important to maintain uh, predictability uh, and to avoid uncertainty for a business community. On the question is uh, economic uh, uh, interpretation of competition law legitimate? Um, I think that the, the general answer was yes, but we saw the difference in perception between those who thought that uh, certainty and legitimacy were the justification for the economic interpretation and uh, some others who thought that uh, uh, the, uh, there were other important uh, goals of uh, competition and that certainty and legitimacy were not sufficient to uh, justify everything. But there was also a discussion of whether within the economic interpretation, we should move toward a total welfare standard, uh, move a little bit away. Uh, on the question of whether we uh, uh, administered uh, uh, too strictly, uh, or we administered too strictly the consumer welfare, I think there was recognition of the flexibility of, in fact, the consumer welfare uh, standard, but there were questions, and there were questions about how it was, in fact, uh, administered, uh, whether the balancing between the efficiency and the anti-competitive effect uh, was uh, really uh, right. And we pointed out to uh, criticism both in the US and the, in the EU and probably everywhere uh, in the world uh, with the idea that maybe the time frame of the analysis needed to uh, be thought about. Um, and uh, finally, on uh, whether we are ready, I think that uh, uh, we are desperately waiting for science, for economists uh, uh, to tell us more about how competition works in the digital world. And in between, we're trying to use our tools. And uh, Christine certainly thought that the tools were adequate uh, to solve a number of problems. Um, there was quite a bit of reservation of regulation as uh, May, maybe being uh, or risking, in fact, to uh, limit competition. So, uh, Bill, we don't talk about it once every year at the Global Forum. We talk about it at the Competition Committee at OECD. We talk about the digital sector on Competition Day at OECD. So we talk about it all the time. But your point on the fact that all competition authorities are faced with the same new problem at the same time, and therefore cooperation coming up to, uh, for solution on this massive global problem was, uh, uh, I think, a, a very important message. To finish this, 
before I thank everyone, I want to give four minutes to Tuak. Tuak wanted to take the floor uh, to tell us their views about whether we need a new focus for competition policy. TUAC is the uh, subsidiary body which represents the trade unions at OECD. So TUAC, you have the floor for four minutes. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. Yes, it's very important for the trade unions to say a few words uh, about competition policies and sustainability because that's how we understand the question whether it's time for, for a reset. I will be um, very brief. Um, we have on several occasions been arguing that corporate power has to be analyzed in the context of increasing precarity, uh, widening inequality, inequalities, and in the wake of this pandemic, the situation for us is taking a new uh, urgency. When we make our demands for public interest objectives to be fully integrated within the competition policies, we often hear reticence, and this panel has shown it again. Um, there are perhaps a fear that by integrating this public policy, public interest objectives, we will be overburdening the plate, or perhaps uh, fear that we might ask our competition agencies to throw by the window uh, years and years of experience. Now, these fears are not entirely justified. There are some activities that can be undertaken uh, within the existing tools, and they should be, because we don't have time to wait for a change in the law. But in the longer run, we also argue that there is also a need for such a legal change to better equip competition authorities with the tools that they need. Now, from there, I have three main messages really uh, to, to this forum. The first message is a plea that when one talks about sustainability, we do not leave the social dimension aside. Now, I haven't heard it very much from this panel this morning, which is rather a wide and compassing approach to the notion of sustainability, but I hear, I hear it uh, elsewhere. Sustainability very often seems to boil down to climate action. And it makes perfect sense, of course, because the sense of emergency is real and the threat of climate change is already here, it's upon us. So, for instance, what we often say within the trade union movement is that there will be no job on the dead planet. So clearly in terms of priority, we align. But let's be clear, without climate action, without the human face, we won't go very far. We won't be able to do anything if you don't have the people backing up those green policies. Because for many of us, the end of the month comes before the end of the world. So what we are calling for is something that we call just transitions. A just transition is a, is a process whereby workers' rights and all livelihoods are secured when we're shifting towards sustainable production. Also, to the extent that one cannot completely trust profit-seeking uh, entities to do what is right, the involvement of workers is an essential element for balanced power within the firm. And it's not the first time that I'm suggesting that when it comes to enforcement and monitoring, competition authorities and workers' representatives should work hand in hand. My second message is that some actions are possible within the existing framework. They can be put in already, some change can already happen already now. Now we will expect, we should expect corporate concentration to increase, both because some companies, especially in the digital sector, are increasing their profitability in the current context, but also because some governments will favor consolidation in order to save their industry. Now concentration will further increase. Therefore, competition authorities need to address labor market monopsony that would also further increase. And this should be done through the connection of collective bargaining and the ban of unfair labor clauses. And another very important aspect is the role of industrial policies. And I think this was one of the conclusions of this panel is that the traditional conflict between industrial policy and competition policy is no longer adapted. These two elements should work uh, forward in the complementary uh, manner so that we can promote a more competition and a switch to sustainable production. And the third message is this, also think long term. Efforts should not be just about treating the symptoms or the consequences of increasing corporate concentration. It's also about tackling the root causes of this. And we think that legal reforms are absolutely necessary widening the consumer welfare standards so as to equip authorities to better deal, to better understand the reality of economic power. And I would like to salute the interventions from uh, Mr. Villacazi, which were absolutely brilliant in this regard. You have made the point very, very clear. Uh, 
So thank you very much, Mr. Chair, for giving me a few minutes to expose the trade union point of view. In a nutshell, we do think time is for us. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much to Tuak. Um, ladies and gentlemen, now it's the time to uh, come to a uh, conclusion to this uh, round table. It seems to me that uh, um, we, we have a lot of reboot to do simultaneously because there are different issues that come with us. Uh, and, uh, but at the same time, I think that it was quite clear uh, that we all agree on the usefulness of competition, on the usefulness of what competition authorities have been doing. Uh, we're just pushing them to think about some issues uh, with, uh, which in some respect uh, require either a little bit of flexibility or uh, rethinking. So you've been a fantastic panel to bring about uh, those issues. Thank you very much for your participation. Uh, I hope that, uh, I think that we've covered a great deal of the possible uh, resets or reboot or updating uh, that we might have. We don't have all the answers uh, and there are uh, some differences of opinion, but I didn't think that the differences of opinions were in fact that great. Uh, we're all try trying to be more effective and recognize that in a dynamic world with lots of changes happening at the same time, that requires thinking on many different fronts. And that's what we've been trying to do. So thank you very much to the panelists and I hope to see you uh, soon and in the meanwhile. And I certainly hope that uh, soon you will be able to come to Paris and we can uh, see each other in person and you don't have to get up so early in the morning like Diana had uh, to, to participate in uh, such an event. Thank you very much to all of you. Tomorrow in the Global Forum, we are going to take one of those issues that uh, uh, we implicitly talked about, which is the issue of abuse of dominance in digital markets and how we can have a handle uh, on this. So I think it's going to be quite interesting. So tomorrow, same time at the OECD Global Forum. Thank you all for your participation. Thank you, take care. Thank you.